Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the uh, Planning Board, Northampton Planning Board meeting of June 27, 2024. We are here both in council chambers and also online via Zoom. Um, we've, we've started a new procedure with our Zoom participants that now during public comment period, they will, will be able to come to the mic, to the podium, so to speak, and deliver their comments themselves rather than um, texting through chat. Uh, and, and of course, other comments are always available to people um, before these public hearings by email or letters to the planning office. Um, we have two items on the agenda. One is a discussion and possible adoption of a historic plan element of sustainable Northampton's climate and resiliency um, plan, and also an application for a site plan review up um, down on 5 Fulton Avenue, Northampton, which is down by the roundabout on Pleasant Street. So before we begin those applications, those hearings, um, we traditionally open it up to public comment. If anyone would like to speak about an issue that's not on the agenda tonight, they'd like to raise to the planning board, please. Let's just speak from here. No, come on up to the podium and give us your name and do we have an extra mic? Yep. Hi, <clears throat> Claudia Lefko, 40 Valley Street. Um, I'm here to do a little catch up on 107 William Street. And I would have sent you a, a picture, a photograph of what it looks like right now, except our internet's been down all day. Even our landline isn't working. It's the like whatever is going on in, in the neighborhood. So, but I think I've sent them to you before, uh, the plan. Uh, when the you know when the developer and Stacy Ashton the uh, the real estate person proposed this development in our neighborhood, they presented us with of course a, a plan, a beautiful looking building, including landscaping all around. And at the bottom of this document, it says special features landscaping. So there were trees and various shrubs and so forth. But the truth is there's no room for any landscaping. The building and the pavement, the parking lot and the driveway are going to the fence. So everything is completely covered at this point. So it seems to me that somehow the planning board or the planning office, when you look at these plans, you must have seen it because you're looking at the dimensions of the building. But the neighborhood people, we're not doing that. We don't look at that so forth. So I feel it's a bit of bad advertising. Even the neighborhood never believed this would happen. All the trees were totally taken away and cut down. And now what we have in this neighborhood that's very verdant, I would say, is this huge building of these condominiums and pavement. And it's at an intersection with Montview Avenue that's going to be a very dangerous intersection. So that's just a catch up. I will send you that plan. It would be really so helpful if these plans come with these diagrams that have no no connection to reality in front of you. If you would flag it to people and say, this doesn't look realistic. You know, if you're going to do this, you should be honest with the neighbors and with the planning board and everybody else about what this is actually going to look like. But now, because the development is there, we're entitled to, I think, $7,000 in traffic calming money. And it's always it's never clear it can be spent in the neighborhood. And I don't know what the planning board has to do with it, but it seems, Carolyn, you have to do with everything in the city, the, from the traffic to the planning to everything, that, that we want to use this in the neighborhood because it's a very dangerous intersection has been created. And I'm hoping that you'll pay attention to that. So thank you for your time. Thank you. I actually didn't come for this. My name is Deborah Berkowitz. Um, and your address, please? Well, I have a few addresses. Well, give us one. Uh, I think for now, um, let's see, uh, 59 Phillips, please. Okay. Um, so I actually came about the historic plan. But um, so, but one of the things that struck me in it under in uh, linking to this the city's sustainability plan was one of the objectives. So Deborah, just sorry to interrupt. Yeah. We're going to take comment on the historic. No, no, I'm not. This is not about the historic. Just a... I'm just reading you something. So there's an objective in the city's um, sustainability plan. It says minimize the loss of tree canopy throughout the city and increase tree canopy in urbanized areas to maintain a higher quality environment in all areas. So I was reading this and I was in a meeting with uh, my, my city councilor a couple days ago and 
we were talking about the incredible loss of tree canopy going on and the flooding that we're having. And so just because I can predict what's going to happen down the road, there's a large development plan for Milton Street where a lot of trees are going to come down and there's already the culvert problem on Federal Street. So there isn't enough money to repair the failed culvert and the city and the the high school's fields are wet most of the time. And if those trees that are planned that will have to come down for that scale of development, uh, not only obviously heat carbon sequestration, but what it's going to do to the city's budget because the city is going to be responsible. There's no way that the, that the tax revenue from those houses is going to make it up. So I would just like to be on the record about this to say that in this loss of trees, it's very related to the flooding that we're having in the city. Thank you. Thank you. Other comments here in council chambers? Okay, well, we'll move over to the participants out there online. Um, is there anyone who would like to raise their hand and make a comment for uh, that are not about the ad two agenda items? I don't see anyone, Carolyn. No, I don't see. Okay. Okay, we'll move into our first hearing then which is at 7 p.m. for the adoption of historic plan element of sustainable Northampton climate resilience and regeneration plan. Um, Carolyn, do you want to give us a little context for this or tell us our role in this um, adoption? Remind us of our role. <laughs> sure. Um, so the um, comprehensive plan for the city has many components and um, can have, there's there's not a set number of components that can be part of a city's plan. Um, we have not really had an um, um, historic plan element in our sort of modern sustainable Northampton plan. And um, that was a gap and the um, historic um, commission um noted that and has been working towards um um delivering that as part of the um overall sustainable northampton plan so what's in front of you is that plan element that will be incorporated into the overall plan and in massachusetts planning boards are the jurisdictional entity that adopts plans for the community um, and so before the adoption of the plan, this would be an amendment to the plan by adding this component in the planning board is charged with holding a pu public hearing and, um, before, um, adopting any modifications to the plan. And so in, um, this plan has been in the works with our consultants for, going on two years. <laughs> um, and so it's been a long process. There's been a lot of public process and um, Judy Barrett from um, uh, Barrett Planning will be presenting the plan and you saw a draft of this previously. Um, and so we've been working on refining that since then. And so um, this is the point now where the board is in the um, charged with holding that public hearing. Do a short presentation on the plan, kind of a summary, and then we'll discuss it a little bit. And I want to recognize also that Martha Lyon, who's the chair of the Historic Commission, is here too, and they've been working hard since that. So you guys are doing your best for them. So this is on, correct? It's green. That means go. Um, good evening. I'm Judy Barrett. I think I've met maybe a couple of you. Um, I was the lead on the team uh, that worked on this plan. My colleague, Kathy Brumer, cannot be here this evening, um, but Kathy handled a lot of the uh, analysis of sort of the existing inventories and kind of the condition of the information that you have. Uh, and we collaborated pretty extensively on the goals and recommendations uh, in the plan. So I'm going to present this to you, and I'm happy to respond to any questions that you may have when I'm, when I'm done. So this plan has certain purposes that we have tried to achieve. And, and I think the most important one is to support the Historical Commission's work in uh, advocacy and public education and preservation. That's their role. And to try to support that and make sure they have the information they need to do the very best job that they can 
and identify ways that the city can provide even more support than it does now to the commission um, in that role to really recognize historic preservation as a basic function of city planning. There are you know, many aspects to your plan that you have done that look frankly great, um, that I think recognize uh, certain elements of the plan is very important. We're trying to say, and historic preservation is also very important um, to kind of understand how the voice of preservation could be uh, perhaps even stronger than it is now um, in city policy and regulatory decisions. Um, and of course, to support the existing comprehensive plan. And I, I just want to make it very clear. I think the city was was very clear with us about what the what the job was here. Um, that there's an existing plan and we needed to look at preservation needs within the context of that plan and think about ways, things that the city can do that will reinforce and uh, and support that plan and not conflict with it. So we took that role and responsibility, I think, very seriously. And so there are, there are you probably, because I'm sure you've all read the plan at this point, there are a few examples in the plan of ways in which this component of the plan tries to support or enrich existing goals uh, in land use, in environmental protection, in economic development um, and housing. I'm not going to read all the text to you, but you have existing goals in your plan. And this document, which also has goals, tries to integrate and support what you have today. Um, in, in doing so, uh, we tried to think about how best can the, can the city carry out preservation activity, preservation decisions, preservation education, and so forth uh, in a way that is going to support the implementation of your existing plan. And so just to kind of give you a little background here, the job of any preservation planning is to understand what you have, evaluate it, understand what, what makes it historic and what makes it important, and then to protect and those are the kind of three key core functions of historic preservation. It probably is no surprise to you that those very same functions exist in other elements of your plan as well. Um, when we think about, uh, about the sort of protection steps, we think about what's the integrity of the existing structure. We think about what's the context, its setting and so forth, and then significance. And I just want to underscore that the significance of a historic resource is probably the thing that is the most, the biggest driver in the conversation about, so what are the appropriate steps to take in protection? In, in kicking this project off, we had to look at what you have today. Um, and as, as sort of the heart of any preservation planning process, there are forms that are used to document um, and there they look at different types of features that may have historic importance in your community. You look at areas, you look at buildings, you look at objects, you look at cemeteries, you look at other kinds of structures um, and parks and landscapes. So the forms that exist to document historic resources cover those types of, uh, of attributes. Um, this plan does not go into detail about archaeological sites simply because the location of those is not public record. So we focus on the things that the city actually has the jurisdiction to, to act on behalf of and to protect. So I think one of the things we, we have discovered in looking through what the city has is that sometimes people are not, not necessarily aware of the information that already exists. We look not only at the inf information you have, but also the condition of the inf inventory. So as you may know, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts through the Mass Histor Massachusetts Historical Commission um, has a pretty extensive database online of all the properties that have been uh, inventory to any degree uh, in the Commonwealth. It's called MACRIS is the great website. Um, we certainly used it extensively in this report, but you also have forms available uh, in other locations uh, in, your, in your community. So we wanted to kind of see, well, what condition are these, are these um, the documentation is. And that map that you see uh, is really an, an illustration of what MACRIS has. So these are data points. They're simply addresses of different types of, um, of resources in your community and, and roughly when th those resources were inventory. So you have some resource inventory through 1975, which is kind of the most recent um, 
period that I think anybody's looking at that's about to change. It will become, we'll sort of add the next 50 years soon. Um, but there are, the, the, the inventory that you have right now is very focused on buildings. And there are other types of historic resources that perhaps have not been as well inventoried. So that makes it hard for the commission to evaluate some of the things that are sometimes brought before it. Um, we did a lot of research on just what you actually have and the condition of it. Um, we made, as a result, a number of recommendations. And the recommendations begin with things that need better inventories. It's hard to be a regulatory body and be presented with a project and not have the information you need to understand the significance of what you're being asked to protect. So you folks all do, I think, really an amazing job here at obviously protecting what you have in this city. I don't ever want to come into Northampton and say, you're not doing enough, but there are things you could do more of. And so we went through the inventory forms that we could find. We looked at the condition of what was, what was on file with the state and tried to identify locations where there are inventory priorities. And those inventory priorities really are about what's critical. The critical ones are the ones that would be deemed kind of most at risk, if you will, for, for failure to have the information. And then there are priorities that fall into the sort of necessary category, things that you need to do, but they're not as critical. Um, and then there are other inventory priorities that are important, but not as critical uh, or necessary um, as, as others. Um, we looked at, uh, you know, we also tried to identify things that we thought were important, were priorities uh, citywide, you know, beyond kind of the area look, it's sort of what do you have around the city? And there are things that are just not in the inventory right now or not up to date um, around, for starters, your own city buildings, your own, own city resources, um, houses of worship. And then features like barns or carriage houses, um, those kinds of features are very important. They are often missing or, or incomplete, I should say, in inventories in other communities. So the fact that you don't have all of this wealth of information is not unique to North Northampton. It's, I think, a struggle for, for many uh, communities. Mm -hmm. um, we also th thought from an inventory perspective that you have some undocumented buildings uh, in the central business core design uh, area that really need to be updated or simply completed. Uh, there are a number of individual properties. I'm not listing them all here, but they're identified in the plan. Um, and and also to think about, well, so how do you get these inventories done? And that's labor intensive. It's hard. Um, that at least, very least, when people are coming to the city for Community Preservation Act funding for historic preservation to require as part of the application process an updated form. So you're kind of you know, getting the applicants to assist with assembling the information that you need. This map simply depicts um, in a color symbolized way what the priorities are that are identified in the plan. Um, I don't think it's any surprise that the darkest color are the ones that we we consider as consultants critical. Um, the somewhat lighter color, uh, orangey sort of color is the necessary. The yellow is important. And then, um, you know, there are just uh, pending ones, ones that at least at the time that the plan was completed, we knew we're, were in process. So we've tried to kind of show you, these are areas that we really think you need to focus on in updating the inventory. Um, as I said, there are these citywide priorities as well, um, location specific ones that simply kind of illustrates, um, goes on to elaborate a little bit on what I just said. So there are other ways in which historic preservation activity matters. And I think what we saw here, th this sort of struck us as, as an important one. And that is just making sure people understand. Does everybody understand what you have? Um, do people understand what's significant? Do people understand what's important? Do people understand what they have at all? So a lot of we th what we were thinking about was how do you take public education strategies that are pretty typical in community planning and, and marry them to historic preservation? So things like an outdoor exhibit program uh, for self-guided exhibits, this is a fairly common, um, I think, feature today in many preservation plans. They're often common features in open space plans. How do you, uh, how do you educate your community um, and help people understand not only what you have, but why it matters? And often that's the story that's not told. Um, to, to do that, you probably need some professional support. 
Um, so helping having professional interpreters kind of help you put this, at least design this system. Um, and then to make use of it by promoting walking tours and um, having programs to support the exhibit and get people to come out and use it. Um, and then have sort of a graphic identity for those wayfinding, what we would call, or self, uh, those interpretive uh, exhibits. So people know as they're going around the city, aha, that's part of the wayfinding system. That's part of the historic uh, preservation education system that we have. And it would just be very recognizable. And it gets people out in the community, which is good. Um, thinking about maybe reviving the preservation awards program here. Uh, I know those are kind of labor intensive, but they really can be very helpful for encouraging people to do, I think what we would like people to do, which is to, to preserve. Um, and to making public information available to alternatives um, to historic building demolition. There are some good examples from other cities about that sort of public ed, uh, public information availability. I would not suggest that you simply take their stuff and run with it because your city is unique, but, but thinking about just how do you even help people understand what the alternatives um, are. Using your own website to facilitate access to the best available information um, is a good way to go uh, so people can find stuff. They don't necessarily know how to go to Macris, but they know how to use the city website. So if you have links to some of these resources, it could be very helpful to people who want to know more about the city's historic resources. One of the great challenges we had in this project, um, one of the very first things you do in any kind of planning activity is you take the assessor's data and you pull it apart and you try to map it and see how old are the buildings, where the different types of um, development take place in the community. It just really gives you a snapshot. Well, unfortunately here, it was very challenging because the field in the database that you need to do that, it's called the year built field. It says when a building was constructed, was conspicuously omissing, uh, om omitted or missing from uh, the database we re received from the city, as well as the one that's available from MassGIS. So just making sure you have that in your assessor's database could really help to enrich the story of how did things evolve in this community? The other thing it can sort of help you do too, uh, not that you're not already aware of this, but just to sort of highlight um, where perhaps, um, you know, some alterations have happened that you wish had not happened. So you, you need the year built information to, to do this. Um, and I would just say that's a real basic. Um, updating and uploading uh, PDF forms for the inventory um, for the National Register nominations. Those are things that, sh that if they're readily available, people can get information. And I think that's the overriding theme of this document is having information that you need, having information the planning board needs, the historical commission, to make the very best decisions on behalf of preservation um, when that is an issue. Um, you know, there are partnerships too that can kind of help in this public education domain, uh, such as with Smith College uh, or other organizations, um, some of which you, you know, have in your community that are already very active in preservation. Looking at your own ordinances, um, you know, maybe considering additional form-based districts um, or some type of neighborhood overlay, conservation overlay design district um, could be very helpful to applicants trying to figure out what you want. And I know you've done some of that, of course, but really to be effective and I think very uh, widely understood, um, you know, you need adequate funding to do these things. It's just not something that you can easily whip out. There needs to be analysis so that the staff can have information and you folks can have the information you need to evaluate a project in accordance with those guidelines that are developed. Um, we think you should consider amending the demolition delay ordinance. Um, it is right now 12 months. We think you should consider taking it to 24, which pretty much has been the standard statewide as communities are trying harder to get bring developers to the table to work with local officials on preserving what's significant and then allowing other, allowing development to take place. It's really not about not allowing any development. It's about preserving what's significant. And so we think that's something that you should consider. It is pretty much um, the, I think the going standard statewide is 24 months, 12 months is, is kind of passe to be honest with you. And then thinking about ways that you could discourage demolition by neglect. So we mentioned maybe looking at um, municipal minimum maintenance ordinances in some other cities 
that could be helpful to you. Um, look, and those are typically housed in health and sanitation code. Sometimes they're in a housing code. Um, sometimes they're just, you know, general ordinances. We've worked on a couple uh, in Massachusetts and, you know, they're not, nothing, none of these are perfect tools, but they help when you put them all together. On the policy side, um, maybe thinking about adding uh, designees to represent the commission's interest on some of the other committees you have that it, it interface with concerns of the commission. Um, leading the way by making sure you're kind of a model for pre preserving your own properties would be, uh, I think, very important. And then thinking about how you can do the best you can to harmonize new development with historic preservation um, to be able to identify what the issues are during the site planning process. So you get the best of everything. You get the development you're looking for in the locations you want it. And at the same time, be able to account for the preservation interests that matter most on a given site. Um, making sure that people participate in the community with Mass Historical Commission uh, training programs, which are very, they're wonderful and they run them all the time and they're on Zoom. So you don't have to go to Boston to do them. Um, thinking about having some additional funding for preservation planning staff. I don't know how your department does what it does, frankly. You people amaze me over there, Sarah, Carolyn. Um, but there's a lot going on in this city, which is great, right? There's a lot going on. But I think it's hard uh, you know, for people to kind of be on top of everything. So thinking about whether there's a way to identify uh, some funding for preservation staff um, and uh, having a preservation planner position. Uh, there are certainly other communities in Massachusetts, roughly in your size range, that do that. Um, looking to the Historical Commission for review and comment on projects that come before you. I'm sure that typically when you have site plan or special permit applications, there are boards and departments that you frequently ask to review projects. Make sure that the historical commissions on the um, re the referral list, if they don't have time to review it, if they don't have an issue, they don't comment. But it's just, again, another way perhaps to bring into the permitting process a perspective from the historical commission. Um, as I mentioned, requiring new MHC forms uh, with CPA applications. And then also thinking about how to do the best job you can using Community Preservation Act funds on capital projects uh, in the city. I think that, um, you know, you have a capital improvements plan and that's great and it does what it's supposed to do. But sometimes I think there are needs in municipal properties here, at least we heard from our many interviews, where CPA funds may have been an appropriate use and, and were not available. So just thinking about how you can elevate that conversation with uh, CPC. Uh, and the and the um, the uh, community services department as well would be a good idea to do. Um, to be thinking about what your criteria are for CPA funding. To look at how are you defining maintenance as opposed to rehabilitation or renovation. Um, you would not be the first community that struggled with that and came up with a way to perhaps think more creatively about how to apply what might be maintenance on another building and a historic property is actually essential rehab or uh, reinvestment. There are you know, features of a building that might need to be replaced or updated, eaves and so forth, windows that some people would say it's just maintenance, but it's really not when it's a historic building. But you have to kind of think about how are we defining this and applying it in our in our CPA funding decisions. Um, I was surprised when I got here that you folks are not a certified local government. And having helped a couple of communities become a CLG, as we call it, uh, I think this would be really important for you. Certified local government is a designation that is approved by Mass Historical Commission and the National Park Service. And frankly, the biggest selling point I can offer you is that it um, it elevates your competitiveness for a grant program called Survey and Planning Grants, which are really an essential tool that other communities all over the state use to do things like inventory updates. But when you're a CLG, your competitiveness is enhanced. So that would be an important thing to do. And you have staff. So that's kind of a critical consideration when MHP looks at a CLG application is do you have capacity in terms of professional expertise? 
and I think you certainly make a case that you do. Um, having a program in place for how are you going to track and and ensure compliance with preservation restrictions uh, that are held here, and then having a log, just how are we actually staying on top of this? If you think about it, when a conservation commission or or a private nonprofit private entity holds a conservation restriction on land, if you don't monitor it, if you don't make sure it's being complied with, you can end up losing a conservation resource. And the same is true with historic preservation. So there needs to be some type of, type of system for, for staying on top of those restrictions and making sure that inappropriate alterations or changes are not made simply because no one was actually checking. Um, having an experienced preservation architect, maybe to conduct inspections and so forth to help the historical commission um, uh, monitor and determine what might be appropriate compliance measures if there is a compliance problem. That really is the heart of the plan. I mean, there's categories of recommendation. I kind of broke them out for you um, on sort of planning, inventory, municipal prop, uh, policies, uh, public education, uh, and so forth. But I, I think I would just say, I think the take home point in all of this is that there's a lot of inventory work to be done here. That's it. I'm, I'll answer any questions I have. Thank you very, very much. I had another chance over the past few days to go through the plan. I had another chance over the past few days to go through the plan. Um, and it's pretty exhaustive, pretty complete. I mean, you know, the details and plus the overview. I think it's going to be a great resource, not only for the city, but anybody interested in the history of Northampton and preservation of items. So thanks for all of that. And the, uh, the very clear charts, too, with those different categories of critical and um, immediate and necessary things like that. So very helpful for, for this novice. Yeah. Questions for the staff or consultant before we open it up to the public? Okay, so why don't we uh, open it up to the public for a few minutes. Anyone would like to comment here at City Council Chambers about the plan, suggestions, or? Why don't we go with? I'll, I'll speak quickly. Okay, take um, your time. It's all right, it's not a big crowd here. I noticed that. It's too bad. Well, um, it's interesting that Judy was talking about inventory because Monday night at the Historical Commission meeting. Could you, you identify have... yourself? So I am. I'm Martha Lyon. I live at 313 Elm Street, and I'm the chair of the Historical Commission. Great. Sorry about that. And we had a meeting on Monday night, um, and we had to review a demolition application, demolition delay, um, yeah, demolition application for a property, uh, the last property in Northampton on Audubon Road. Does anybody know where it, have, know what house that is, where it is? Anyway, um, so we knew absolutely nothing about this property. It, there was no information even really about when it was built. Um, it had a concrete block foundation, so that kind of gave us a little bit of information. And so we had to make this decision based on almost nothing. And this is a reason why um, the work that Judy's done to illuminate um, the deficiencies and in the information we have about our historic resources is really important. But I really just wanted to um, thank uh, Judy and her team for this. Um, the seeds of, of this project were planted over 10 years ago after the Historical Commission merged with the Historic District Commission. We used to have two, and we merged. And at that point, the new entity recognized that there was really some uh, type, a need for some type of guiding document, that the uh, commissions had been sort of reactive for a long time, and we wanted to think more proactively and kind of get out ahead of the preservation issues in the city. And we needed to um, have some kind of guiding doc document to make that happen. So now we have this, and I think simply put, there's so much to elaborate on here, but uh, I wanted to just say two things. Um, this is document really spells out for the commission what we need to do to act as responsible stewards of the historic resources of the city, and that's our job. And so now we have um, 21 different goals that we need to work on, and it's going to take a lot, and we're all aware, but I think it's um, it, it really puts us in the right track. 
And then I also think that it's important in its way of um, seeing how preservation can help support the other goals of the city uh, in the sustainability plan and the other different areas, housing, open space, recreation, et cetera. And that really elevates preservation to a different um, level. So that's good. So speaking on behalf of the commission as a chair, I just wanted to thank Carolyn and Sarah for their guidance in this um, and for Judy's team in producing this very comprehensive document. And I think also through uh, the voices of the city residents who came out for the public engagement activities um, and responded, um, you know, they were very uh, lively and had a lot of opinions and those were all recorded and considered. And I, um, it, what it, for me as the chair of this commission, it was reassuring to hear the enthusiasm for the support of uh, history in the city. So I feel like we are now on a firmer path to um, preservation. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Did you have? Oh, Claudia Lefko again, Forty Valley Street. So I was already here earlier speaking about a problem about historic. I think about historic preservation. The house that was demolished to put up this atrocious eight-unit condominium on One Hundred Seven William Street wasn't necessarily historic to the city, but it was historic to the neighborhood. It's a very prominent house. We've done a uh, neighborhood oral history. People who grew up in that house commented about it and what place their family had in the neighborhood, what the house had in the neighborhood, but this wasn't considered historic, you know? And so on some level, I, I, you know, and I apologize because again, our internet was down all day. So I couldn't go back and look at your recommendations. I, somebody said there was a tornado in Connecticut, and maybe that's what's happening. But anyway, the issue for me is that the city is not really responding to the neighborhood's concerns about historic preservation. So I don't see that the city needs to educate the public, but I think the public on some level has been trying to educate the city and speaking up about what is important. Like I live in Ward 3B. I think I couldn't see on the map, but it was a yellow area where the last two streets in the city before you get to, to the meadows, the meadows. The city used to be called Meadow City. That's how important the meadows are. And our, the houses on in our, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. The houses in our neighborhood are not looked on as historic. They're vernacular. They used to be affordable houses. They're not affordable anymore. And part of the problem is because of the infill. But, but honestly, we have been hard pressed to make the point to the city that there's anything worth preserving in Montview neighborhood. And so I feel like the report needs to reflect this. And, and I'll speak to the issue that the historic, you know, historic Northampton, which is a prize private, private uh, and, uh, organization, wrote to Wayne Fiden some years ago about the number of phone calls and concerned citizens that can contact them about historic preservation and their concerns about neighborhoods. And that he and they hoped that this plan would speak to this, but I don't hear that in the plan. I don't hear about preserving neighborhoods. I hear about preserving, you know, a building here and a building there and the downtown and so forth, things that are considered historic. But what is historic? I mean, I come from a historic neighborhood and I have been basically fighting for years to make that point to the city. So I feel like a narrative that would to speak to that. And even I, I think before the plan is adopted, it would be, it would be wise to, to look at this. It's going on all over the city, not just in Montview. People are concerned about the neighborhoods and the neighborhoods are exactly the heart of the city, to be honest, rather than the downtown. So where you want to promote tourism and have a map of where people might work like we're just trying to 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 hold our own here so rather than and you know i think it'd be great if tourists came and walked around monfew but mostly they don't want to do that because the sidewalks are not walkable but anyway that's my point i really would appreciate if you would send would add to this i think there's something very much missing from here so thank you 
but we'll add it when you get a chance to look at the full report. And the not report. before, but I just didn't review it, so I apologize. But it does speak to some of the goals being to look at some of those historic neighborhoods oh. in Northampton yes. and doing an inventory of them at historic designation, whether it's Reef, Bay State, and even the area. Even worse. <laughs> Thanks. So, yes, thank you. Yes. Anyone else? Hi, still Deborah Berkovitz at 59 Phillips Place. And thank you for that picture of the, that carriage house is one of the best outbuildings uh, in Northampton and seems to be somewhat endangered down the street from me. Um, so this was an amazing read. I'm just a regular citizen who actually read the entire document. So uh, it was beautiful. It was great. Um, and there are just a couple things that I want to highlight. One is that the demo delay, we had asked in the past um, what the outcomes of the demolition delays were, and the numbers were not quite not it, there was a the wording was a little off, but basically out of about a hundred, um, it seems that like maybe three buildings were actually saved, um, and so. What just thinking from a data perspective, that probably seems like not an outcome that uh, it doesn't sound like that's succeeding too well, if only a few out of 100. And of course, most, you know, people are not necessarily the demo delays aren't even always happening when they should. Um, and we had one developer who actually um, threatened retaliation uh, out loud involving two different projects that had delays that he was going to um, he was going to up them uh, in light of the fact that that delays were being sought. And um, so I, I agree with the 24 month, especially given the fact that it is kind of the, the gold standard. And also um, just like one little thing that was in there is that the option for a single historic district um, to be imposed um, that, that you can have a single house historic district is incredibly important. So this maybe was after you kind of started the project. I don't know, but um, the city just lost an early 18th century building on Market Street with the, you know, kind of approval of the city. And, um, you know, once we lose those buildings, they're just, they're gone. And um, so then, uh, you know, like trees, once, you know, buildings are gone, they're gone. And um, so... The, there was a little talked about this, but in terms of the economic benefit to the city, there are cities that have done studies about the economic benefits so that it's really worth investing in historic preservation um, because the city ends up getting, there's a whole host of reasons. But the other thing is the environmental benefit. And I thought this was actually not addressed quite as much as it could have been um, in the plan around, um, there's a vast amount of data around the benefits of preserving buildings rather than promoting new development. And so all of the, while there were a lot of really great suggestions of what might um, support the preservation of buildings, I mean, I've been doing one for two and a half years and it's really expensive when you're a private, you know, there's, I'm doing it because, you know, I, I feel a responsibility as a steward of a building, but most people don't. And, you know, if they're in it for money or whatever, there aren't other ways to make it happen. But I think that the um, environmental benefits fit in really well with the city's sustainability plan and the climate crisis. And so although it's not really called out here, it is another very important part of um, a historic preservation plan. And then the last thing is just, I, I mean, there's no question that our planning and sustainability office does a great job with very minimal staff. And and I do think that there's conflicts of interest that are just like they're they're actual conflict of 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 needs in some ways of the city between preservation and uh sustainability and, and development that's being sought. And um so I was also struck in the report by ways that of thinking about how to kind of parse out in some ways some of these responsibilities because I think having one person or one office trying to do all of this inevitably some things end up you know being prioritized over others so that's all thank you thank you anyone else here in council chambers would like to speak to the plan okay then we'll move out to our friends online um Anyone would like to speak to the plan? Would you raise your hand? Is there anyone online who would like to speak to the plan, make comment about the plan in favor, questions? I see Jacqueline on an iPhone. Uh, 
Hi, good evening, uh, Jacqueline McCreener, uh, Northampton and in Ward 3. I also want to uh, thank the Historical Commission and Judy Barrett and Kath Kathleen Broomer for this um, lovely historic preservation plan. I know that Northampton has had other really wonderful uh, historic preservation plans like the one from 1991 that were not, uh, the recommendations weren't followed. So I hope that a lot of the recommendations in this plan are followed. And I agree that the 24 year uh, uh, month demolition delay would be important for our community. Um, there is a lot of demolition by neglect with developers you know, purchasing rehabable starter homes, keeping the windows open for a year, letting the place decay, and uh, and then it's easy to to demolish that home. Um, and we don't have a landfill in Northampton anymore, so that debris gets trucked off to a distant landfill in upstate New York, creating an enormous carbon footprint, which doesn't exactly fit with our sustainability plan which I would also like to see enforced to a greater degree. Um, and so then what often goes up in place of that home are townhouses and condos that have exorbitant price tags attached to them. Um, I would really like to see, you know, signage when you're coming off the ramps of, of 91 into Northampton saying, you know, come down to our historic um, downtown and, and yeah, check out all of our lovely historic resources because we have a lot, um, but development is threatening them. And on a sustainability level, we are losing a lot of trees, a lot of wetlands and a lot of vernal pools in our URB and URC districts. And, um, that is a shame because it is jeopardizing the public health, safety, and general where welfare of residents in Northampton. Um, and climate change is here; it's not going away, and it's important to um, to plan for that and to protect the natural resources that we have, which protect us. Uh, we are aware residents, on on a, on to some degree, are aware that um, this plan was not done simultaneously with the community's sustainable master plan. So as Judy Barrett was saying, that that sustainable master plan is already in place and she and Kathleen and their team had to kind of retrofit this histi uh, historic preservation plan within that framework. And one thing that residents have been asking for two years now is to hold a educational awareness meeting on neighborhood conservation districts, just because the city is not listening to residents. And our historic neighborhoods are being threatened by infill. Our affordability is being threatened by infill. And there is environmental and social injustice going on with infill and our historic neighborhoods and our natural resources like significant trees, wetlands, and vernal pools. So Carolyn has said that once uh, the planning board adopts this historic preservation element, that that educational awareness process, process can begin with neighborhood conservation districts. And residents are really serious about this. We are tired of being railroaded by the city. So I just wanna make that point really clear that we are expecting to be able to have a discussion about neighborhood conservation districts. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Nan S, would you like to say something, Nan? Hello, Nan. 
Yep, sorry, I was having a hard time getting unmuted there. Uh, Nancy Smith um, from uh, Chapel Street, the Chapel Grove uh, neighborhood, which includes uh, Laurel Street and um, Rust Ave. And I um, want to echo everything that Jackie, Claudia, and uh, Deb said, and just add a little something about the chapel on Chapel Street. I heard about, uh, you know, improving our inventory. I don't know if that chapel is on there, but um, it's way older than 1975. It could be 1875 from the looks of it. Beautiful little place and it actually has an active um uh church membership but they haven't been able to use it for years because it's in need of repair so um i would love to see um something positive happen with that and also that whole uh metrics block that that chapel is on uh there's several historic homes there one was recently restored i believe that was a speakeasy uh during prohibition so that's certainly something that's uh historical and all of them are in um i'm sure as you know are in danger because of that PV zoning change we made for the metrics uh, building to put up the workhouse, um, the workforce housing, and then the um, planning, uh, the plan, plan village district got moved. So it'd be very easy for our developer to take that down, no city council or anything. So I'm hoping that that, um, that neighborhood, particularly that chapel, um, gets some attention. And thank you very much for the plan and for your time. Thank you. Thank you, Nancy. <clears throat> Anyone else online who would like to speak to the plan? All right. I don't see any raised hands. So back to board members. Questions or comments about the plan? Reactions? Um, so you mentioned the same demolition de delay that we have this very unfashionable 12-month uh, delay. When I look around, like there's no, it doesn't seem like MHC has a database, but from what I can see, there's six months, there's 12 months. I mean, do you have data on, not that because someone else does this or that, we should do it, but I, I don't see any specific data. I would admit that we are passe, but that's for other reasons, maybe. <laughs> so I don't know if Mass Historical Commission has a database on this. I can't answer yeah. that question. What I okay. can say, um, we do a lot of work in comprehensive planning, and this issue comes up a lot because sure. of many the concerns that you have that you hear here are are heard everywhere. And so, as communities are reviewing their demolition delay, mm -hmm. um, the communities that are reviewing it and updating it are generally going to going to twenty four months. I can just tell you based on my experience. Okay, but, but I don't have data. I don't. There's no data. Okay. There's a lot of communities do a lot of crazy things. <laughs> yeah, well, I, not every community is dealing with Northampton. <laughs> yeah, not every community is dealing with the wealth of resources that you have either. Uh -huh. Got it. Um, second question is I think this kind of came up in the when you came I, and remind me when when did we review the draft? That was 2023, but I can't remember when. We did the fall presentation in October. Yeah, and there was some conversation around this thing of the neighborhood conservation districts. Um doesn't seem like it was edited or if anything it's more throughout the document now it seems to be a hot i mean maybe it's the same as it was in the draft i don't know um it seems to be a hot item in some places where it's trying to be implemented in cambridge and other places it's been struck down in other places it's somewhat controversial um, i can address this mm -hmm. um there is a decision on a neighborhood conservation district from brookline that mm -hmm. was shot down that and what the basically what what Brookline's ordinance tried to do was and that it was regulate land use through a general ordinance. And you can't do that, you know. Land use is land use at zoning. Mm -hmm. So the Brookline ordinance was struck down. And um we've been waiting to see if Cambridge was going to adopt uh another neighborhood conservation district as a general ordinance, and to date that has not happened. Mm -hmm. But the many of the objectives that you're trying to achieve through neighborhood conservation districts can be done as a zoning overlay. So, mm -hmm. you know, I we, we actually kind of changed the wording in this to talk mm -hmm. about a neighborhood conservation overlay design district, um, because you have the ability through zoning mm -hmm. to do some of the things that I think people are concerned about. We're not going to say just whole cloth, go and adopt a neighborhood conservation district without more legal review and guidance from the courts. So my comment to you is, as a planner, I don't give legal advice. I think if you actually want to go the route of a general ordinance, you should consult with your city solicitor. 
right now, um, there's a real question about the legality of going right. that route. So it is mentioned 16 times in the plan. Mm -hmm. So I'm just concerned that if it's in there that many times, it, you know, for people who aren't here today and read this five years from now, it says the planning board is endorsing these neighborhood conservation districts when I think it's a very complicated issue that needs to be discussed a lot. I, if I might, David, I think each time that it's mentioned in the plan, it's kind of either or the NCD or the, I forget the other literature. Special the, preservation. Yeah, district. Right, right. So it should kind of look at those two models if you wanted to in preservation. In other words, I don't think at one time it was ever proposed as kind of a solution for Northampton, but something like so many of the suggest, suggestions in here are recommendations. Um, and I and maybe we, we, we will get a chance as a planning board to talk a little bit more about it and do some more research on that. Mm -hmm. um, I think just to clarify, the bottom line is you can't implement anything without more information. And so I don't know that the that any of the um, proposed or recommended potential solutions are appropriate um, for one place or another because there's just not enough data about that place. And so I think that seems to come out pretty clearly that the top recommendation is really you have to understand what you have first. You have to do inventory. And so you can't just jump to a conclusion that X or Y is the solution for a neighborhood without really understanding. Can, can I also add to the purpose of a neighborhood conservation district is not to stop development. And it shouldn't be used as a land use tool. Mm -hmm. What it is about is providing guidance to permitting authorities about aspects of of a place or a neighborhood a streetscape a, you know a, a historic streetscape things that are significant going back to my earlier comment about identify evaluate and uh, and protect you have to know what's significant and and to be able to account for those things perhaps in guidance to applicants around their site design i think that's the issue it's not that you're trying to use a neighborhood conservation district to somehow stop what really is properly belongs in the zoning ordinance. I mean, I don't know. We're not going to be naive here. I mean, we know what they're used for. I mean, I mean, come on. I, I agree. It's it's not a hard line, but I mean, whoa. Well, I, I I mean, I, I I I hear you in terms of like the um, the information gathering, the inventorying. I think all that, as Carolyn said, is incredibly important, and I totally am fully behind all of that part of it um i'm concerned about some of the language that again feels somewhat ambiguous and again like is this is meant to be a plan that's going to be a standalone document for many years so um, i'm somewhat concerned about it so i i and i think what we need to do too is uh Kind of agree on what we're doing tonight this adoption of the plan mm -hmm. doesn't mean that we're agreeing wholeheartedly to each of the recommendations here we the planning board aren't promoting 24 hour 24 months um re requirement for d demolition delay we're not voting to require the planning board to i mean the planning office to hire a part-time staffer oh. to do this work there's a number of recommendations in here that our recommendations by the consultant and the historic commission, perhaps, but we're not by adopting the plan, um, approving them or giving our, our our total backing to. And I think there's, you know, I think the um, what you're talking about falls into that category. It's referenced in the plan, but it doesn't mean that it's going to happen. It's not an ordinance. It's not going to be passed right. by the city council. Yeah. Yep. Chris, so what are we doing tonight? So is this just public. Is this just we're just hearing from the public tonight. Are we making any recommendations? Tonight? Yeah, we're we're going to have a motion, I believe, to adopt this plan, this historic preservation plan, as part of our our city's master plan. <clears throat> the recommendations that are in there, the suggestions that are in there, the 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 shape and format of the plan, the uh, much as we did for the open space and recreation plan a few years ago, you know, that had a lot of uh, goals and dreams and wishes in it, and we adopted it as part of our master plan. 
So, yeah, I think at the end of our deliberation, we're going to have a motion to either adopt or postpone, you know, adopts another plan. Um, but certainly the store commission and the planning office want to try to move forward with it. I mean, I could suggest if um, you, the, as you said, there's sort of a couple of options. You could deliberate some more and um, take an action tonight. You could also decide that you want to look at in detail about some of the language and and look at, you know, modification for coming back to have a vote on adoption. So, um, you know, if there is something that you feel like needs a little bit more work or tweaking, that's, I mean, that's totally up to you. Uh, I would just, interesting. Um, this report is incredible and it's got a lot to really for the city to sink its teeth into. Um, you know, this action item list here of almost 50 action items is really something that the city can um, really start to wrap its arms around. And as you said, inventorying is right up there and the criti critical thing. So like that part, I have zero hesitations about incorporating this. To, to David's point, you know, some of the other line items now, this is this is just in the in the table, there's more explanation in the narrative, right? But in the table, you know, one recommendation is amend the demolition ordinance to lengthen delay period to 18 or 24 months. Mm -hmm. So by us saying that we want to adopt this into our sustainability plan, we're not saying that we agree with that today. So that's a little, we're not saying we don't, but is it? I don't know. Are we or are we not? Well, is it misleading if we adopt a document that says, I mean, most of them just say, you know, conduct a regulatory audit, you know, consider additional, blah, blah. But some of the line items say amend, amend, add. Are we saying, yes, we agree, we should amend? And I think that's a right, valid... like hire staff to like go around and check on all these. Right. Properties. I mean, by us what endorsing do... them, we should include this it's are we saying that we agree with every single of the 47 possible things that we can look at i, I get i get the intention is that these are, these are areas that we should look at as a city we should look at them they're suggestions they're fantastic suggestions but language wise five years from now with a different board are, are we going to have rooms full of people saying you endorsed this and it's said to amend? I think we should seriously consider. We should have this conversation that we're having right now about that. I, I don't know what the answer is. <laughs> so if I might just specifically around the ordinance. So in a, in an ordinance to amend, it has a whole process. Right. It might come from the historic commission. It would go to a city councilor. The city council would make that ordinance kind of proposal. Then it would come to the planning board and we would vet it. So no, we're not really endorsing anything at this point other than the spirit and kind of the overall um, goals and objectives of the plan. Um, so, yeah, that is buying into some of the consultant suggestions. But again, the suggestions, I want to believe, came from a lot of the, the Northampton residents who, who voiced their opinions at the public meetings. Yep. So if there was a will out there that the consultants heard that maybe the demolition delay isn't working, um, that maybe it should be extended to 18 or 24, that sure. it, that's kind of what they gathered from the community. I don't think it's just these two consultants who posited that, but, you right. know, uh, so I'm not personally nervous about um, adopting the plan, even though it contains some suggestions, specific ones that personally I may still have some questions about. I think that's the, the nature of these comprehensive plans. I 100% agree with you. And I believe that that's the spirit that we're dealing with. Some of the line items say consider restoring traditional separation. Maybe if it just said consider amending the demolition ordinance, if we want to get really nitpicky. Uh huh. Uh huh. Just 
Otherwise, yeah. you know, we are we can all sit here tonight and say we understand the the you know how this is being presented to us. We just don't want it to be misconstrued down the line when there's different folks sitting in these seats. Yeah, I think it's really difficult because I think there's not a single recommendation in here that doesn't have some significant positive mm. potentials, po positive outcomes. Some of them also have trade-offs, major trade-offs, and sometimes could be quite controversial trade-offs. And I think it's just not that simple to say, like, on some of these issues, like, I think they're good or bad. So I, I do think, like, I like it when it's phrased as study further, you know, consult acknowledging that all of these would require a whole long process to actually implement. But I don't think in seven or eight or nine years, someone's going to be like, well, George said, you know, it was really just the spirit of it. You know, like no one knows that really later on. I agree with the spirit. I mean, I think we're all on the same page in terms of the spirit of this document. I think it's great. And that's something I've been tracking for many years. This has been a long process. Um, but this is an issue that affects a lot of people who, for whom like historic preservation is not on their radar at all. And they're not paying attention to the process, but they are potentially affected highly by, you know, some of those trade-offs. Um, so I, I don't know. All right. Um, other comments? So I, I'm not sure how to move forward then. Do we do we offer to go through this line by line and make some of that wordsmithing come from uh, recommend to consider? Um, or is there a word search that we do every place where it says recommend, we throw in consider? Um, and that's an edit that we could approve tonight and move forward? Or do you want to spend some... I, I appreciate that you went through it in, in some detail. Melissa, uh, as I did, but I mean, I don't want to be a cog in the wheel here. You know, I don't want to hold things up. And it's just we have sat here many times with people saying to us, it says right here, this is what you're supposed to be doing. And the that was it it's uh -huh. <laughs> Yeah. Somebody who's not paying any attention to this right now and then a project comes up in their neighborhood and it affects them may just go onto the website, grab this and say, you adopted it. And it says right here, this is what you're going to do. And we we can, and the, those of us that are sitting in these seats at that point can say what you just said, George, that was the spirit. We adopted this as the spirit and that every single one of these line items was, you know, going to be a process and we can sit here in the and we can say that as long as we're prepared to say that i'm okay with approving it but people are going to come to us and say they're going to and feel that we're approving things because we're adopting this that's a valid point and i think people do come uh when there's an application on and they get the sustainability plan especially in all those metrics and all that language and uh and they put that out there as us and we deliberate around that and say well yes we understand that and that's you know kind of a, a guidance for us but in this situation um we as a as representing the community decide that this application merits this even though in the sustainability plan it says that and i think that sustainability plan is much more specific about its um outcomes and its measures and deliverables than than this is but um yeah comments from the audience i think public uh comment is still open um, please come back up well just you know from the public point of view i agree with i agree that more specificity is better it's just clearer because we've paid and spent all this time with the consultant we should come to some conclusion maybe if if that working with the consultant and this whatever commissions because we do go to these documents and expect some to be able the public wants to know well what can we expect from this and 
how will we hold anybody accountable for that decision? And so I feel like it's very important to be to be more specific, whether it's to change the language for that one term to the other. But I agree that I think for me, it, it would be very helpful to have more specific language. It's worth the effort, the extra time, perhaps, I'd say. Thanks. Thank you. Um, so just, I, I have a question. You are again, Deborah Berkovitz. we have to do it each time. Yeah. Okay. Still. Uh, so I have a question about when the other plans were adopted, if there was a similar process of revising the language that had been done by the, um, by the consultants, because the sustainability plan does have incredibly uh, directive language, like all, and I'm just looking at examples here, support, develop, um, uh, minimize, like just those words are in there very specifically. So when the other plans, all the different components were done, was there like a stopping, we're going to go back and redo what the consultant said in order to, uh, or is this, is this unique somehow to this issue or this board in, in its current con construct? No, I don't think it's unique at all. I, I remember as being part of that sustainability plan that Many, many people looked at drafts of that plan, and it, they were certainly, I think, a little bit more invested mm -hmm. because of the high stakes of that sustainability plan. And I, I don't mean to demean our historic preservation efforts, but people have it weighed in in the same way as they have with the sustainability plan. So, no, I don't think the language has been vetted the same across the uh, uh, across the city and by different boards mm -hmm. um, than the sustainability plan was. But we certainly had a take at it back in October of last year. Um, we looked at it. We gave some feedback to the consultant. Um, but we hadn't seen that final draft yet until, you know, uh, a month ago or so. Mm -hmm. I think actually what Ms. Berkovitz is raising is exactly the issue, is that for almost all other parts of the plan, we talk ad nauseum about every aspect of it. And this is a very large chunk, and admittedly, it's not implemented as legislation right away or ordinance or whatever, but it is, in a sense, coming in through the side door through a different process that is definitely off of people's radars, and it's not going through that public process. And by suddenly coming to planning board and we see it twice and have two hearings, then suddenly it's getting a very sort of, I don't know, in some words, like like a mainstream um endorsement uh you know in a way that it has not had a public it, it has been public in the official way of an open meeting law and it's being posted and things but it's not on it's not on anyone's radar in northampton in in a general way in the way that our school budget is on our people's radar sure things like that sure and um that's that's i, I so i think that issue is exactly the right one to mm -hmm. be thinking about um, so I would say that I think the commission or the group of citizens who are most invested in this is the historical commission, you know, and they've been looking at it probably ad nauseum around the language and the goals. And so I guess I'm giving some of my trust to them that they're representing us and the city in looking at that and plus the planning office staff. But um, I understand. And if we were to offer up a couple more public hearings, I'm not sure what we get here, you know? Yeah. I, um, yeah. So the city, again, is mm. the residents are looking at us to kind of to vet it. And I mean, these, these are goals mm -hmm. that the consultant is recommending that we look at, get that. And I guess in the broader context of the 134 page document, I think that's clear that these are goals that the, that, that, our consultant has asked the city to look at. Here's a here's a here's a roadmap for you guys of things you could consider. Yep. Um, and we'll just you know we'll have to be prepared if folks come to us and say this is in your plan, you should be approving it. We go through the process, like you said, George. We look at every we look at every project on its own merit, and by then this will have evolved. And certain line items, we hopefully will have more inventory and more involvement with the historical um, committee. Um, Do we need to adopt this plan for the city to prioritize inventorying? We do. 
Yes. I mean, it's good to have a policy document. I just want to, um, I think what you all are talking about is the difference between a plan and regulations. And so the specificity about regulations is not here. This is a policy document. And so it's just giving a, a roadmap, as Melissa suggested, about further actions that if the city felt it was appropriate to pursue um, uh, procedures that involved um, different reviews by the board when up, when projects come forward, then that's a separate process to establish that procedure. So just because it's in the policy guidance doesn't mean that it's ultimately um, required to be implemented. Do you think our city website is clear that the existing policy documents we have are just that, like a roadmap? And that the things that say the planning board is considering when we see projects is based on codes and ordinances and not these policy documents that people love to bring up and point at. <laughs> well, I mean, you, so there is, there are a couple of different reviews um, that the board undertakes and under special permit, um, there's a provision where the board needs to make sure that a project is consistent with the policy documents in addition to the regulatory documents. So there are some elements that do require, you know, the board to consider those. And yes, there are there are items that are internally conflicting or some people might consider them internally conflicting or um, even within the existing plan and certainly within this plan and within this, um, this element and its relationship to potentially other elements in the in the plan um, and it's a balance and that makes the um, evaluation more complex mm -hmm. um, for the board to make but um, there will always be areas of um, both overlap and potentially, you know, weighing, you know, the the benefits of of multiple policy objectives that are um, identified in all the elements of the plan. And this document might be the historical commission might, at some point, be put into that same predicament with this document once we adopt it. Right. So if anything that's under their jurisdiction for review, sure. They're yeah. What would the process look like if we did want to tweak a little bit of the language? You can just um you can close the public hearing and you can have sort of set aside a time to do deliberation and then sort of individually if you wanted to make rec you know suggestions and then bring it back to another meeting for the board to further deliberate um, and then take a vote, you can do that. While we're thinking about that, I have a, just a, this thing about the no year built. My understanding is that the Hall of Records burned down in 1900 and there is no particular, so even that small thing of like, we should have the year built. That's like any norm, <laughs> I mean, it's, it's a small issue, but it's like saying like the planning board thinks we should spend $50,000 going out and figuring out, like, I don't know what year my, my house was built. There's no way to figure it out. It doesn't, ex it's not like a piece of information that's out there. Can I address that? And I actually think this plan should say somewhere like why we don't have it and it would actually. Really but you're not history. the only community. Well, it doesn't matter. I'm just saying for our community, we have this, this situation where the thing burned down. It would be nice to have it in the plan that this is why that information is not there. So those of us who work with these records, uh, I can tell you that every community has a lot of properties that are listed as 1900 and the conditions may be different, but the situation is the same. And in most communities where I see that issue, it's because the assessor doesn't know. So 1900 becomes this date that just sort of shows up and you have to acknowledge what it is if you're mapping or working with the data. Um, if the assessor does know the year built, then it's in the, it's in the, um, the database but it's, it, this is not the only community that has that challenge. Uh, so in an ideal world, we would have a team of investigators who did some kind of dentrochronology to try to figure out when a home was built. 
but we we're not going to have that. Well, I think I actually I think that information is in a lot of your assessors' cards. It's just not in the database. Well, uh, that's not been my experience, but anyway, maybe. No, I also want to bring up this issue about the community preservation applications. I think you were saying like CPA applications that are MHC or whatever, something on the list or something have to provide a PNF or do some kind of inventory. I would not endorse that at all. The Some of the people who are going after historic preservation dollars are asking for, they're often nonprofits with no funding. I've done PNFs before, they're not cheap. And to ask people to spend that much more money to ask for money to do when they're trying to do the right thing just seems arduous and not in the spirit of CPA. I understand like there's broader reasons why we want more inventorying to happen, but I, I don't think putting it on um, many of those applicants who just don't have the funds to do it uh, makes a lot of sense. I like the idea of the city paying for it over time or something, but um, yeah. Well, the good news is the city is going to be the main applicant to maintain its own buildings so they can pay to for the public buildings. Yeah, but we're talking about a long list of yeah. potential properties here. So, but David, so that's a good case in point. Isn't that a recommendation that in an ideal world, it would be great if application, that's one vehicle to get this information on properties during the CPC process. So I think the CPC would vet that and say, okay, are we going to ask all of our applicants to do that? And at that point in time, they'll work through the pros and cons of that and come up with a recommendation. But I think the plan is just suggesting that this would be very helpful for the city in order to continue to gather data. This would be one way to get at it. Um, and I, I don't think by us approving the plan, we're saying that the CPC should do this. Um, they're going to spend their own time kind of walking through that protocol. I think the I think the plan, the reason we hired consultants is because they have this breadth of looking at other cities and what they've done in terms of historic preservation, and they're bringing to us kind of these best practices and making some recommendations. But to, to this reader, it doesn't mean that we're all approving those or accepting that that's going to be the way to go. Well, um, certainly we can't decree it, but it sounds like we're suggesting it. By adopting, if that language is adopted, it seems like it's our recommendation. I, I want to be careful with these kinds of things because we're entering a pretty ugly period of city government where there's not a lot of money to go around. And elected officials love the idea of things that are zero cost on the budget and make some people like say, oh, you did a thing. And we're saying HP2, goal HP2, actions, one of the bullet points is require updated inventory forms for historic resources considered for CPA Act funding. Cost the mayor and the city council zero dollars to make that required. And it costs all of the applicants a lot of money to make that happen. So I just don't think, I don't agree with that. I don't want that. I wouldn't, you know, I haven't, there's a there's a lot of things like that that I think we should be careful about. And, and it could be that we say in there and we just couch the language a little bit and like study, like, you know, like we were talking about. I just, I think we need to be careful about this kind of thing. Please just turn on your button there, Rich. Okay. Yeah, I, I see no problem with uh, inserting some kind of qualifier at the beginning of the whole shooting match just to say the following are, are recommendations that should be considered and are not shouldn't be construed as requirements of action you know to one sentence you could fix this I don't remember when the actual language says that. This is the spreadsheet, the nice, neat little walk-away spreadsheet. But each one of these line items have a little chunk. So, you know, is that sort of, is it clear in there that these are, these are ideas? I mean, Oops. We brought in a consultant who, who lives in this world and has brought to us many ideas we may not have thought of on our own, and which is great. Um, you know, does it say in there that that we 
We're suggesting that the city look at these. And adoption of this is uh, not, use my legal legalese that I don't have. <laughs> it is not. Uh, yeah. 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 I mean, I, I sympathize with the consultant. I mean, when you, if you read the reports when MHC was funded, was founded for all the different reports, for there's a long list of, we don't know that much about the state of Massachusetts. And here's all the inventories we should be doing for the Pioneer Valley and archaeological, all these things. And over 50 years, like some of it's been done, most of it hasn't been done. And so I think everyone in, that world has a long history of look at the things we have to do. And it's very frustrating that a lot of it just continues not to be done. I totally understand that. And that's why I'm totally on board with all of the inventorying and information gathering um, goals. I think it makes a lot of sense. Um, so uh, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm puzzled on how to move forward. You know? Well, so there's a couple of ways to move forward. I think that I hear is one, um, we take Stacy's suggestion of have a little subcommittee or we each pour over this again and try to um, tweak the language at places that seem like we're decreeing something. Um, or we take another suggestion from Rich was to uh, have some kind of preface, a caveat that, you know, this is the, the board while adopting this plan is not suggesting that all of these will become um, reality legislatively in the city, something like that. I like Richard's idea where way better than us pouring through this. <laughs> it's not our, this is what we, you know, I mean. Uh, it, Please come on up. Mark. Do I need to state my name again? You do. Okay, Martha Lyon, <laughs> chair of the historical commission. Um, just a couple of things. Um, how often is the comprehensive plan updated? Every 10 years? Um, well, it's, yeah, about. Okay. And you just did one. Okay. So we're already three years into that. Right. So um, there are two things. One is that we have really limited capacity to do any implementation. And if we get through, you know, a handful of these recommendations by the time the plan is updated again, um, we'll be lucky. I mean, we have, I've been the chair, I don't know how long, chair. I remember we've almost never had a full slate of the seven commissioners there. We're losing a couple this, you know, the end of this week. And, um, you know, Sarah and um, Carolyn are really busy people. And we try, we as uh, members of the commission try to do what we can, but um, not all of us is retired <laughs> and we have uh, work lives of our own. So um, I think... So that's one thing, just to keep that in mind, that um, in some ways this is a, a hope, a wish, and that to get this down um, as policy now, and in seven years when the plan gets updated, this will be looked at again, correct? Um, and maybe, you know, some of these things drop off the list or could some get added, I don't know, but I just wanted to put that into perspective. And then I think also the point, George, you made about how every one of these, anything that's policy related is going to have to go through a very long vetting process, not only with um, the leadership in the city, but also the public. Um, and duty, you know, I think explained the neighborhood conservation district issue, you know, that's very controversial and um, borderline legal, borderline illegal. <laughs> so- It's um, not a general ordinance. Right? Yes, exactly. So. You know that's going to take a lot of time to to um, to you know hash out if it ever does. It just may not be possible. So I just want to put that in perspective. Um, I'm not asking you to endure, you know to move ahead and to just um, dismiss all the things that you've talked about because I think they're all really valid and I'm glad you're thinking that way. Um, but that's just uh, where I'm coming from. Thank you. Do you know what you say the specific language says here that this plan is designed to enrich the comprehensive plan with analysis, goals, and recommendations to protect the city's historic resources and historic landscape. It doesn't say we're implementing any of this as policy. Um, or legislation. And then when it goes into the actual the title of the actual strategies is Historic Preservation Plan Goals and Strategies. I think we either leave it alone 
because if we start to pick at it, it's just, I don't see that working out very well. Um, so a goal is aspirational? It, goals and strategies and analysis goals and recommendations. That's what the words say. Right there, you could add another sentence. You could add a one negative. sentence it right said, there. It said something negative, like, don't take it to mean this. Nothing in here <laughs> constitutes legal, blah, blah, blah. blah that not but it could, you know, the other way to think about it is there's the section of goals and recommendations and then action plan. So at the top of that section, you could have that sort of qualifying sentence. So, because mm -hmm. people are going to jump right to the- Right, one sentence. Um, goals and recommendations, and they might jump to the action plan as well. So you could have it repeated there. So with that section four and five, mm -hmm. um, and with, you know, a sentence of that sort. And is there a way that we could, I mean, I would, if if we decided to do that, we, we could either say, we, we have to hear that and then approve it at another meeting, or we could say that we recommend adoption of this, given that sentence that will be sent to Carolyn. Yeah, I, I think that's what we do I, with our permit. Yes, exactly. Yep. Uh, right. So that we can sort of not muddy this up. It, you, just real quickly, Chris, back to your comment about goals or aspirational. You know, the the sustainability plan that we had about the, the climate regeneration, it's that's so specific. The metrics are really specific, laid out this many, that, and that many of these, that by this and this date, this is very much different, very aspirational and suggestive. Yeah. So I, I, I like that suggestion um, to a, approve the plan with language that softens kind of um, any kind of uh, legislative oomph behind this plan. And I appreciate that you read that forward again about that. But I'm also open to the idea of option B. Well, I'm leaning more towards. <laughs> I'm leaning more towards the qualifying sentence yeah. for each. That would be for each three sections. I think two for so two for sections. The, um, there's um, goals and recommendations, and then the action. In the action, okay. First, yeah, and they could so, be the same. I mean, it could be the same. You know, the following actions and recommendations for implementation items are identified as um, to be considered by the by the city and I don't know what else you said. Um, and not to be- And not to be uh, taken as uh, obligatory, right? Not to be know. construed as- Yeah. Uh, as Mandates. Um, as implemented or adopted as law or right. however or that- man yeah, Or mandated or happens. Mandated is a good word, yeah. One more time. Yeah, then I'll stop because it's getting dark. I don't know how this will help the public. If you say, well, here's the document, but we don't really know what it means. Or here's the document and it could, it's kind of aspirational. So so it's for somebody who who's trying to do preserve something historic and they want to say, well, what's the city going to say? They'll go and say, well, they, they hope to do this, but 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 what did what did they conclude? I mean, someone has to come down somewhere and say something, you know. And so, if if the document could somehow actually say something, that would be useful. Well, I mean, are, I know it says a lot. Well, right? these are these are all areas that we want to look at. Right. That's what it says. Because we already knew there was a thousand areas. We're going to look at these at, areas. And I'm just urging you to please be specific. Right. And just to clarify, this is not regulatory. Right. right. This right. is a policy document, so it will never be used to. I think that's, say, I think that's, that's what exactly we... the thing I'm talking about. Is right. This is what's going to happen. Right. But that we have to keep saying those those kind of issues are addressed in zoning, and the building commissioner and regulatory um, process and stipulations like that. That's just what we keep needing to say to the public. Okay, but when you work, when you look at in many jurisdictions, these historic preservation 
guidelines right, work their way into base for all intents and purposes zoning. And there is not like such a line between these things as you're imagining. We don't really deal with that in Northampton for the most part. No, but I don't know that we can solve that here though. But we're making a pretty big advocacy of doing a lot more of that that no, I... I don't have experience with and i'm i'm agreeing with 90 percent of what everyone's saying i just want to make sure that like however that caveat language is about recognizing that there are very complicated issues here that need to be explored because i think what was just said um yeah by the member of the republic is how it's going to be taken this is going to be taken as this is what the city thinks that is exactly how it's going to be taken by people who want to preserve certain yeah. things for very good reasons and for right. all kinds of reasons, you know. So. Does it help if we say something along the lines that we're recommending we're recommending adoption of this plan as a policy document only to be considered further as an element of the we we are we are adopt we would be recommending recommending adoption of it into the sustainable northampton climate resilience and renovation plan but does it help at all that we state as a board that we see this as a policy document not a you know clarifying this is a what carolyn just said not a legislative document policy yeah. document i think a lot of the public would consider a policy document as, as legislation, as legislation, right. So it's more of a commun uh, education thing and a communication thing between us and the public. But that's why I was asking on the website, like when you go to click on and find this plan, does it kind of say that before you click on the thing and read the plan? Is there like an overall statement that this is it's a red? This is a policy it's document. It's not, you know, the zoning code. But right. most for most people, a PDF on a website, yep. is a PDF on a website. Right. I mean, that, right. that doesn't matter what the policy document, what the legislative document. I wouldn't honestly know that I could tell you the difference between those things before we had this conversation. But if I'm a developer and I want to do something in it with that overlapping with historic preservation, I'm really going to look to zoning and the building codes, right? And then maybe use a little bit of this historic preservation plan in my application to fluff it up a bit. But I'm really going to be driven by the zoning and the building codes, mm, right? That's um, that's a whole other conversation. I don't know that we want to go there. Yeah. There's additional legislation that's adopted based on some of these recommendations right. that then creates another process that someone has to go through or another yeah. review criteria. Uh, there, I mean, there, there could be elements that go through a formal legislative process if there's someone say, hypothetically say someone owns a piece of property and they want to build a beautiful affordable housing development that is great and then they read this and they say oh it looks like northampton's very interested in doing a huge amount of inventory and making a neighborhood uh conservation district around this property i don't think i want to deal with that i'm not going to do that that's we don't see those applications and that's that's the sort of what you call the chilling effect of these types of things it's very hard to measure. Zero cost, again, to elected officials. Mm -hmm. um, and I agree like with uh, what Ms. Lefko said. is like, you want specificity. And the truth is, we are providing specificity, but we haven't read the thing. So maybe uh, it should be talked over and uh, looked at by in the next session, however the board is constituted uh, at that time. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, um, the the real hard part of this is that there's an expectation of more work in order suggested kind of work. It's a work plan, right? And yet yeah. we're we're very evident. We're very conscious that the planning office and the city doesn't have the resources to do that. But it does give them some kind of again, not a blueprint, but a roadmap. If that day does come when they get some staff. And then they'll they'll have that kind of roadmap, um, and that's really I think what the planning is about. Um, we're not providing an ordinance here; we're just providing this roadmap yeah. um, for the planning office and for 
Uh, yeah, and to some degree for residents, um, if they want specific, specific that That's what you said, then they'll 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 call. We're fortunately we live in a small town, so even even the developer will get in touch with the planning office. What is this about this NDA stuff? You know, and they'll tweak that out, just as I think many residents do, um, if they're really looking to drill down to the details. But I think all of our plans are are by and large, you know, aspirational and roadmaps to for our, our residents and our city um, employees to use moving forward. Um, I, I I think we could tweak this forever and a day, and somebody will still find their way around it. They read it their own way yeah. um, on the website or what they hear from their neighbor or um, what they bring here. So. I think with the addition of the language that we talked about, this document as it stands today is further in the direction of what we want. It It's allowing us to move forward more than it is causing us headaches. And that's looking into a crystal ball because I'll probably be sitting here two years from now where somebody's challenging this saying you said, but we have to, uh, I, I, I feel like a lot of work went into this with the right spirit of trying to look for ways forward. And if we just can make that one adjustment, that one sentence, I I would feel comfortable supporting it. I agree. Do you want me just to make a motion and then we can do that it? That would be helpful. All right. Yep. All right, we'll just make a motion and we'll see how the chips fall. Okay. All right. So I'm going to move that we adopt. Um, we're going to move that we, uh, for adoption of the historic plan element um, of sustainable Northampton climate resilience and regeneration plan with the one sentence that we have spoken about implemented into the document two locations. That work? Yeah. Is that specific enough? Is there a second? Motion's been made by Melissa and seconded by Stacy. Any more discussion? What do we need, Carolyn, in order to move adoption of this? Four, four votes in favor. All right, all those in favor? Thank you. Okay. Okay. All right. Thank you for all of your comments, everybody. Um, so the motion carries. We have adopted the um, the proposed the historic plan element. Thank you, everybody, for your your time and attention here. Thank you very much for coming in tonight. I know it wasn't easy. We appreciate you being here and all the work you put into this. And thank you, Martha, and all your your cohorts on the historic commission. Good luck moving forward. When I hit the lottery, it's going right to you. <laughs> Bring it on. Yeah, I, I just want to also recognize, like, the Historic Commission and Community Preservation Commission has been working on this for many, many, many years. Um, and so it takes a lot of hard work, and, and it's all very, very well-paid work, I'm sure, So, <laughs> in spirit. So <laughs> thank you for continuing on with it. It's a great discussion. Thank you. We're going to take a quick two minute break before we open up the next application. If the applicants can wait just a few more minutes. I agree. I agree with you. It's tricky. It's tricky. No matter what you do, is will be using all kinds of windows in the future. But Two minutes, Stacey. Yeah. No word on recommendation. My kid's calling me. Oh, even Probably better. Even better. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
That's why I'm really working for the person who's doing and they for all the notes and all that. Yeah. So, in Boston, there's no that I don't know. Nobody does. Nobody does do that. There's always like school needs and other needs that you're way over one another. Yeah. I don't want to get more of this stuff. Abraham, 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 Abraham
Um, it's why our town draws many visitors. And many of them come into town right off of 91, up Pleasant Street or Palm Street. Some of them stay at the hotels that are adjacent to this property. Um, it's a high traffic, very visible location, and it's a gateway to our city. Another reason that I love Northampton, and I believe many of my fellow residents love it too, is the city's commitment to sustainability. Uh, as a community, we're always pushing to do what we can to be good citizens of the planet, um, to hopefully leave it in a better place than how we found it. But that's increasingly harder to do, uh, and it seems like we can't do it fast enough. This project is Bruce's effort uh, at trying to do his part to leave the planet a better place by helping to make electric vehicle ownership a more viable option, not only for residents of Northampton, but also for the many visitors to Northampton or those who may be just making a trip from New York to Vermont and they just need to get charged up. Um, in the US, transportation accounts for about 29% of total greenhouse gas emissions. Electric vehicles or EVs are a crucial component of the strategy to mitigate global warming. Uh, EVs reduce greenhouse gas emissions, increase energy efficiency, and improve urban air quality. The lack of comprehensive and accessible EV charging infrastructure is a significant barrier to the widespread adoption of electric vehicles. Addressing this issue requires coordinated efforts from governments, communities, and sometimes individuals in order to expand and enhance the charging network, making EV ownership more convenient and more feasible to, for a broader range of consumers. So, Hopefully that gives you some context about why this project is being proposed and why we believe this project is in line with the city's commitment to sustainability and why this location is ideally suited uh, for this uh, project and um, as a gateway to the city of Murphy. So let's dive into the details if I know how to share the screen. Yeah. There's a green button there that says screen Technology always messes me up. <laughs> um, so this is the site which you may be familiar with. Is the cursor? That's the person who's around. So you can see the site here. Um, there was the former office for Pleasant Journey, and then their garage. And as you can see, the majority of the lot is paved, and the rotary as you come off of ninety one is. And I'm showing the PV panel canopy and the charging station because that is really the driving force of this project. Here's a little bit of orientation, again, just showing the um, where the property is located in the orange and then the surrounding buildings. And I'll go into a little bit more detail. Um, but this is ProLube over here. This is the car wash and Sheriff's Office, this is Little uh, Florida Savings Bank, ATM area, uh, the hotels across the street on Tug Street, and uh, infamous Netta. Maybe it's not infamous. <laughs> um, across the street on Tug Street is the Fairfield uh, Hotel. And as you can see, it has um, uh, a lot of wall space. They've done some colors of different deepest to break up the massing, but not a whole lot of glazing. Our, our netta um, with brick and horizontal siding of some sort, whether it's vinyl or flowers and asphalt roof. Across the street is Prolude, a um, CMU or concrete masonry unit, uh, facade with garage doors and some sort of Maybe metal siding at the top banding, the car wash, lots of glazing. And here's the former site. Um, 
So as you can see, as a used car lot, the parking was right up to the property line, the green strip between uh, the paved parking and the sidewalk is actually part of city property. And then again on Con Street, the cars are right up to the sidewalk. Uh, the former buildings, the office actually faced to the center of the property and there wasn't really any frontage at all on this property. So back again, to this view, just again, emphasizing that there's a lot of asphalt on this existing property. One small corner on Fulton and Pleasant Street has a little green patch with the signage. So, and this is what we're proposing along Fulton Street is that 4,700 square foot building. It would have three commercial spaces. Um, there are some patio areas out on either uh, east and west side. Uh, the building is uh, facing somewhat south, mostly south. So we've got PV on the roof and we've got PV over the electric charging. There's 10 electric charging stations here, or parking spots, I should say. There's nine spots uh, against the building and for cuts on uh, both Pleasant Street and on the street. We've eliminated what were, uh, there were two curb cuts on Fulton Street and there was another curb cut on Pleasant Street. So this is just a very basic diagram of what the building will look like. Um, it's intended to be two uh, commercial spaces on either end that could be food service. Uh, seating would be at the outer edges and probably some sort of kitchen space in here. The center retail space would be um, grab and go prepackaged food. Um, I should say Fulton Street is at the top of the page. There's three entrances off of Fulton Street. We're providing a new sidewalk and green strip um, along Fulton Street. And then on the parking, at uh, the back of the building where the parking is, there's a covered walkway where you enter into a common hallway slash vestibule that has access to shared bathrooms, a little vending machine area, um, and some equipment spaces. So the design of the building is, um, is meeting the new uh, form-based uh, code and that it needs to be at least 20 feet on the Fulton side and no less than uh, 12 feet on the back side. Um, it's a very compact building. Uh, Bruce really wanted to have sort of a clean, modern Scandinavian look for this building. Um, proposed materials would be a white stucco facade with black fiberglass windows and storefronts and doors, horizontal black steel cable canopies over the doorways on ponds in Fulton Street. Um, the facade on Fulton Street, which is the bottom uh, rendering, um, is broken up into bays. Uh, each doorway is set back slightly, and that bay over the doorways has a vertical um, wood composite material to warm it up. Um, On Pleasant Street, it's it's facing primarily east, so we have larger windows on this side. And then on the south side, uh, you can sort of see that it's got that covered walkway uh, into each of the doorways into the building. And this is just a section cut through the building showing that there's a mechanical well. Um, some potentially good news is that we can hopefully get rid of that mechanical well. Um, we, 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 Bruce has <clears throat> potentially found a way to do ground source heat pumps instead of air source heat pumps at a reasonable cost. So we hope to have just a, um, a single roof plane with no bathtub. These are just some views of what the property used to look like. So on the corner of Collins and Fulton Street, and this is what we hope it will look like. There's that little um, patio area. There is a little retaining wall there because there's some level changes in order to make the building fully accessible. 
And then if you're um, driving up Con Street, this is the view that you would get. You can see the PV canopy and the building beyond. And then if you're coming up Pleasant Street, what it used to look like, and what you would see with the new building and PV canopy, in addition to trees. And then on the corner of Pleasant and Fulton Street, what it used to look like. And I will point out, you can see the used car sign there. We would like to um, pay homage to what was there. <laughs> we use that sign, but perhaps with different lettering. <laughs> um, I will say in general that uh, the sign, because we don't know who the tenants are, the signage has not really been taken out at this point. Um, but we're suggesting the future conditions of signage. That would be a separate signage. Uh, photometrics um, on the Pleasant Street side up here, you can see the property line here. Uh, there are three pole lights. Um, we weren't able to get the photometrics for the pole lights that are the city lights along the sidewalk there. So you can see that some of um, the light from our property is, is filling out. And just to go over the light pictures, we have some recessed um, pictures that are the underside of the canopy, so on the underside of the walkway back here, and the uh, three canopies that are along Fulton Street. Uh, so we are, again, spilling over the property line on Fulton Street a little bit at the doorway uh, on the sidewalk. Um, that is a, a safety um, and a code requirement that we have uh, exterior lighting and exit doors. On um, each of the um, the patio areas, we have these down light um, wall uh, sconces. So uh, the light would just be coming out of the bottom of the fixture and lighting up those patios. Um, and then underside of the solar canopy would be the C2 fixture here, um, lighting up the parking spaces back there. Uh, and no light spillage to the back of the property. Um, and we do have some sign lights over uh, the Fulton Street signs for both sign and that is this picture again, also down past um, Fulcock and we are reading the new uh, Yes. Yes. <laughs> so I'm gonna turn it over to Rachel. <laughs> Hands are going to rotate a little bit. We've been looking at the true north of up, and for ease of seeing the site, and we're just totally rotating. So, to the to the right on the plans, the roundabout, Pleasant Street will be on the top side of the plan. Also, now will be on the left, and the Street will be on the right. The day on mission. Green now? Okay, can you hear me now? <laughs> okay. Um, as Elon mentioned, the existing site um, is mostly paved. A thousand, there's only 1,400 square feet that is unpaved on the site. Um, and there are four curb cuts on the site, two on Pleasant and two on Fulton Ave. There is an existing um, bike lane and sidewalk along Pleasant Street. Um, it's really dodgy along Fulton Ave, and um, there's a really nice side sidewalk along Con Street. Um, there are two existing. There were there were two existing buildings were recently dem demolished on site, uh, and then uh, Lawrence Banks uh, curb cuts are within within thirty feet of of the property. Uh, the proposed plan, um, as Elon mentioned, uh, introduces a one-story building along Fulton Ave, right up to that zero lot line development, um, creating a really nice street edge along Fulton Ave. Um, we are also proposing to uh, modify the edge of the curb and tighten up Fulton Ave to 26 feet width. 
Um, and that what that allows us to have um, is an improvement over the existing condition where we are able to put in a tree belt and a six foot wide pedestrian walkway along Fulton Ave, increasing pedestrian connectivity um, from Pleasant to Con Streets. In addition, uh, we've cited the building so that um, all the entrances are universally accessible, no ramps, no rails are needed to get into all of the doors on site. Um, we we also have um, on site, we have 19 parking spaces, 10 of which are dedicated to the solar, solar charging, uh, sorry, EV charging underneath the solar canopy. Um, I should mention that uh, the canopy itself um, may may be revisited as funding um, funding as Bruce works through the funding numbers more. Um, if there are changes, then we'll have to come back um, with a reduced reduced canopy. Um, and also, additionally, in DPW's review of the setbacks, they pointed out that parking is not allowed within ten feet of the property line. Is that? Um. So typically for a new setup, for, for it's the front lot line, you've got three fronts here or your, your main front is open. So if you could identify the issue about parking within 10 feet of the line. However, because of this orientation of the parcel, um, Fulton is the official front. Um, there's also a provision in the code for pre-existing conditions where landscaping and parking layouts are not compliant, that there is a that there's an allowance if a project's coming through site plan review, that um as long as um essentially there's improvement and additional landscape buffers are created between the lot line and um, the parking that um, the site doesn't have to necessarily meet the entire standard. So there may be ways to reduce the width of the parking to make the buffer a little bit bigger. But anyway, I just want to identify that as an issue. There isn't the ability actually under this 9.1 section for in commercial districts when um, the existing conditions um, are such that um, they can't meet the buffer zones and currently don't, that the full 10 foot setback could be um, um, could be a, um, essentially waived for a portion, but you might wanna point out that it's not consistent across, okay. that for the most part you're 10 feet. There's just two corners that aren't. Um, and again, this isn't officially the front, it's really intended to be that front Fulton Street would be the front. And so it's really just those back corner uh, points where it's not 10 feet. So would that waiver be part of our decision? We yeah, so you can approve the site plan as, and you can discuss ways that maybe they could get it a little, little further. I don't know, what did you say, three feet? Is that the point? Yeah, that two and a half on the, on the top of the plan, um, the Pleasant Street side okay. from the property line and three like three feet on the southern. Okay. And it's the property line right at the sidewalk? Uh, the, the property line is right at the sidewalk on Con Street, but the property line is like 10 or 12 feet from the sidewalk on Pleasant Street. And I would just note, too, the, the striped parking widths are nine and a half feet. Zoning only requires eight and a half. So, you know, if there's some wiggle room, particularly on the Con Street side that's closer to the sidewalk, that might be something to discuss with the applicant. Uh, are those parking space, the parking space layout is based on the canopy columns and? It, it's multiple factors is a very tight area yeah. indeed. So we've got the, the vertical supports of the columns, the chargers themselves and their clearances. We additionally went out and collectively looked at a bunch of different charging um, spots in the area to see and we measured the dimensions and we observed people backing in and driving in um sometimes people would actually take up two spots to charge because they want room to maneuver with with the charger depending where it fit on the car so we were we were trying to be considerate of folks with larger vehicles say if you had a 
a truck right. when you're trying to back in here. Um, so the, the parking spaces to the south are nine and a half feet wide. The parking spaces on um, on the on the Pleasant Street side are nine feet wide. In addition, we have an accessible parking space. The guidance suggests that that should be 11 feet wide. It's not, doesn't, you can't mark it as accessible, but it is for an accessible um, vehicle if they needed it. Um, so we could, we could, we could work with, we'd, we'd like it this way. <laughs> we need to um, make some adjustments. We, there may be a little bit of room to maneuver. Um, What's the treatment on the um, con street side between the parking space and the sidewalk? What's going on right there? Um, we have some cobbles there. Mm -hmm. um, we we were worried about uh, you know the people getting out with the door opening and things and and um, making sure that there was there is access to this into the space. Um, originally, we were thinking shrubs or something, but then also didn't want to block sight lines for folks pulling in and out. Um, Thanks. I'll just go, I'll just go back through the plans again. Also, I'll mention that this this property um, did have some former contamination associated with uh, the gasoline in the ground. Um, so there is an AUL on the property. Um, there are restrictions associated with that. One being that we are not allowed to have residential use on this property. I know the Gateway District Zone really encourages that, um, but that's a restriction that we'd have to follow. And then. Um, any any excavation, any site work, there will be an LSP on site to observe. Um, and then the building also um, will need some venting underneath um, for safety for the for the occupants. So this is a really challenging site to development to develop and we're thankful that Bruce is willing to take it on. Mm -hmm. um, and then a demo we do have a demolition and erosion control plan in place on one of the comments from the city engineer, um, there's a there's an entire form that the contractor could use and just sub submit this plan uh, with. And also, um, because we are proposing work within Fulton Ave, um, we will be needing to submit uh, a sidewalk management and traffic management plan for review and approval um, with with the building department prior. So it just and that totally makes sense. So we are again, we're gonna um, we're gonna reduce the width of Fulton Ave. And and um, increase the sidewalk space. Um, additionally, the existing drainage coming across Kant Street actually goes into the property. This is municipal drainage um, into the into Fulton Ave, um, and we we did have those lines sculpted with Fletcher Drain and Heritage Surveyors picked up picked that up, um, and we've been working with DPW, um, and so the proposed condition um, will be rerouting the drainage outside of the property boundary and improving that condition. Mm -hmm. um, back to the site plan, uh, we- uh, Sorry, can I interrupt one sure. second? Carolyn, what's the process with, I mean, narrowing the city road or like, we like these it. drainage improves? <laughs> yeah, yeah, but what's- Say that it is, we're, we're matching, we're making it the same width. Right yeah. now it's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's more consistent. It's not necessarily narrowing it and totally. It's just making it all the same. Yeah, no, I'm, of... I'm, I'm totally on board with doing it. I'm just asking what the process is with the city. Like, who approves that? DPW. Okay. Yeah, but they've been working. With, they, the applicants been working with DPW on this plan. Okay. And yeah, it solves a lot of problems on both. You know, both for the applicant and the city, and especially getting the drainage off of this private property makes sense. Okay, yeah. thanks. So we do have that new six foot wide sidewalk with uh, uh, access into the building from Fulton Ave. Um, off of that, we also have patio designated patio areas on, on both of the corners of the building. Um, we're providing extra space for seating and gathering um, and also helps with sight lines too. So. Um, for folks who are trying to navigate those corners, they don't they don't have a solid wall of a building blocking them. Um, and then on site two, we do have a little bit of uh, shrubs and ground cover proposed. I'll show you some examples in the slides of what we're thinking. Uh, we we are proposing um, instead of a dumpster, we're proposing roller bins for the for the commercial spaces that are enclosed in a six foot high fence. Um, 
and then um, this is the canopy outline covering the the charging stations. And then we have a, a drainage swale at the back, which I'll show you talk about the drainage in a moment. Um, and we're providing, you know, more of that vegetated green space on, on the Pleasant Street side. Today, there are no trees on site, so we're going to be improving that uh, with up to five trees along Fulton Ave and then the three shade trees along Pleasant Street. The project does have some electrical infrastructure needs, which includes a transformer and a switch gear, which we're currently showing here um, along on the Con Street side. Um, additionally, we have, um, we've designated a bike bike parking spaces here. And it's another waiver that we're asking for. These bike parking spaces are within 50 feet of the of both of these entries, but the third is it's just beyond. Um, and we we have limited space here for, for additional bike parking given the infrastructure needs of the project. So these are some of the amenities we're thinking of, the bike racks, raised planters in one of the patio areas. Um, movable seating and chairs for the cafe areas. And then we're going to be distinguishing the patio areas with, with another material or texture like unitized pavers or stamped concrete from the city sidewalks. I'm sorry, can you go back one screen to the site plan there? Yeah. How are you handling the uh, the boundary between the ATM and Florence Bank in your lot? Yeah, thank you. Um, Today there is there's a fence and we're going to be we're going to be replacing it with an eight foot high fence. Um, the fence right now is about a foot or two into the property. And we're going to be regrading that area and putting in drainage. So um, we definitely need to remove the fence to do the work. And then we'll be putting the eight foot high fence back. Is there one central door into the building from the parking lot side? There's, there's, there's three doors. So there's a central door, and then there's one near each of the um, retail spaces. Yeah. It's one large vestibule. But the vestibule goes to the two retail spaces. It does, yep. Yeah. yeah, so it's all. Little too, right? There's little vestibules on the front at, at Fulton Street, but on the back, uh, I'm sorry, that plan shows vestibules, but we. Oh, okay. <laughs> on the back, but the uh, we determined we don't really need those, that we could just have one larger vestibule because it's not um it's less than three thousand square feet. I'm just trying to get around the new curtain the bike racks. If you have that one central door facing the parking lot, it's really small. Yeah, you could do that. Okay. Close the store, you can get any other units, right? Yeah. You can, that is true. Right. Okay. So I do think okay. Um, these are some of the trees that we're thinking about. Um, a sour, a sourwood tree along Bolton Ave, a tulip poplar, willow oak, and sassafras along Pleasant Street. And of course, these trees um, are subject to the review of the tree warden, and also may change based upon what's available in the, in the nursery at the time. Um, and then thinking about a mix of um, evergreen ground covers and shrubs, and some flowering shrubs. Um, within the site. Uh, Utility-wise, so as I mentioned before, that um, we're intercepting this existing drainage line um, and by introducing a new manhole to intercept it and redirect it to another manhole and to the existing manhole on Fulton Ave. We're connecting to the existing sewer service along Fulton Ave with a six inch sewer pipe we're going to connect to the 12 inch water main on Con Street with a two inch connection to the building and the building is sized so that it does not need fire suppression. So um, this is currently domestic only. And then drainage wise, um, we will have some yard drains collecting water from the patio area uh, that ties into roof drains from the canopy um, that then connect to the Fulton Ave um, drainage system. We're going to drop in a new manhole here um, to connect our system to the existing line. And then any of the runoff from the solar canopy, the solar canopy is pitched to the south, which is here to the right on the screen. Any of the runoff from that will be collected in a, um, a gravel 
gravel under drain infiltration trench, but then that area is collected into the system that's connected to Fulton Ave. The site is very shallow. We, we Again, we sited the building so that it would be fully accessible, which means that um, this corner of the site is kind of the highest point. And so the parking lot slopes in this direction to this corner. So any of the water coming off of the parking lot will then be collected in a stormwater treatment structure before it goes into the city system. Electric wise, uh, we do have each of these little green squares are the EV chargers, and they would be connected back to the switch gear and the transformer in site. DPW gave us comments on the stormwater yeah. Plan. Yeah. Good. Um. Yes, and they, you know, I think um, the only there's no separate stormwater permitting for this site. Um. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, and it's not a major project, so um, it's below that threshold. So, um, and of course they're improving the impervious <laughs> site conditions. Um, and so there were comments um, about really detailed technical comments um, that they'd like to see in sort of revised plans. Um, and then a recommendation of, you know, creating an erosion control plan during construction um, to maintain the site because there'll be lots of disturbance. Um, uh, next to all three right of ways so yeah so uh, and i think so the waivers that we would be seeking um would be the parking within 10 feet of the property line which I understand may not be a waiver to ask for um a reduction in the number of spaces so for today on site there are 31 parking spaces um we're proposing 19 um if we were to use the the cafe use um, for, to generate numbers based upon the zoning, we'd be in the, the 48 to 47 range. Can you say that once again. Um, I said if we were if we were to use the calculations based upon the size of the restaurant, we would be required to have anywhere, depending on the category of the restaurant, 42 to 47 spaces. Um, and so we have 19. Um, and then, so that that's parking and then a waiver for the light trespasses, Elon mentioned with the building on the zero lot line development and providing lighting for, to the doors and to the canopies. Um, we, we do have some light trespass beyond the property line and that that's for safety. Um, we are meeting all of the city requirements for max foot candle color temperature and bug rating. Um, Just quickly back to the parking. Um, you mentioned that of the 19 spaces, you were, you were providing a quasi one for accessibility under the canopy. Is there a, a handicapped space in front of the restaurant? Yeah, we have we have one dedicated van accessible space. It actually could be expanded to two if needed. Yeah, um, and then we have one. 11 foot wide EV charging space um, when actually both of those could be used for someone who is mobily challenged. Is there street parking open? No. There is. There is? No, I was I think you're saying yes. I said no. No. There is on cons. There is on cons, right? Mm -hmm. Next to Netta, right? Yep. What was the parking? I'm sorry, you said 3,000 square feet. Um, were you classifying it as based on seating or are you looking at IT? Um, okay. Two venues could host up to 86 seats with a 400 square foot kitchen. So for full restaurant. Yeah. 
So in the CBG for food establishments with dine-in seating requires one space per two seats plus one space per 100 square feet. So that's 42.5 spaces plus, so 47 spaces. Which is more than what's currently there. Right, which is more than what fit on the site. It seems like a lot. <laughs> we agree. Yeah. <laughs> okay, for up like uh, 20, 20 spaces, you want to think it's like 19, yeah. 42, 47, 47. 42 to 47. Yeah. <clears throat> It, it looks right to me when I look at it size-wise and parking-wise, and that number of 47 seems very high. Um, and understanding that, you know, you've got the hotels across the road and the new development going in. I mean, there's, uh, there's a law that I love about this project. Um, do we, giving a waiver on, from 47 to 19 spaces seems a little daunting to me, even though I, I don't necessarily feel that it needs more. That's what our ordinances say. So on the, uh, just to put it in context, so some, a lot of the reason why there, in some situations there might be a concern about a lack of parking because of what the spillover impacts might be to in particular, a residential neighborhood. Yeah. This site is completely surrounded by commercial yeah. uses. So effectively, the issue is going to be problem for the property owner mm. and not necessarily anybody else. Um, so I think that concern about impacts to, you know, surrounding uh, uh, residential. I don't think that's quite right. I think this is a type of parking parking problem that we have not encountered yet. This is, I mean, I agree. I think this is a very kind of a visionary project. This is a type of level three charging with most of the level three charging in Massachusetts or in most places is like you're in the back of a shell station or next to a Tesla thing. It's a horrible experience. Normal. You're like seeking to provide a nice experience for people who it's a self-selecting group of people who own electric vehicles. So it's like, it's very smart people walking across the street from the hotel. I don't see like a lot of people like driving from elsewhere in Northampton to go like have coffee next to the circle by the shell station, you know? <laughs> but it's going to be really attractive for people coming up 91 mm -hmm. to like get off real quick, have a 18 minute coffee and a whatever, and then go leave. I think the issue is like, I don't know. It's very hard to predict. Like, what is the demand for that? How many people are going to, because I think, like if you're going to want people to sit down for an hour, but the cars on a level three charge in 15 minutes, then you're going to make them move across. Like, do you need overflow? And I think this is all, okay. The reason I'm bringing this up, I don't think the issue is for the owner. I think the issue is what if it's like a high demand thing? You're going to get a lot of people who are going to like circle this very congested potential, potentially very congested area. It's already a very like tricky area for people who are like circling, trying to find the entrance to the Florence bank drive through and, like, I don't know. It's it, it's hard to wrap. I don't think there should be more parking particularly, but I, I don't know exactly know how to think about it. We do have some information from the car charging folks. And Bruce, do you want to address that? Well, in, in terms you might, of- I think you have to get up and introduce yourself, sorry. Do I gotta say my name? Yes. Uh, Bruce Fultz. Um, you know, I've been working uh, closely with Livingston, which is providing the charger and the setup. And, you know, this is, you know, you had mentioned visionary. This is about the future. You know, what they are saying is uh, four to six percent usage for the first year. Um, and then it goes up as hopefully more EVs are adopted. So, um you know, it is hard to predict how much you see it is, but I'm trying to address a lot of issues in terms of this being uh, looked at more as a fueling station. It just happens to be electric instead of gas. 
So uh, I don't really know what the demand is. You know, I hope that there is a big demand for the chargers because of because that is where I potentially make money. the The cost of developing this site is not going to be covered by the building. You know, it just the numbers just don't work. So it does have to be based on the chargers. But there's a quick turnaround for those. Um, you know, anywhere from eighteen minutes to up to an hour, depending on the size of the batteries. Um, so, you know, the parking situation, uh, I don't know how to predict what it's going to be and nobody else does either. Cause I've asked. Yeah, no, it's tricky. So. Did, I don't know, are you done with the presentation or is there, are you, were there other things? I mean, we kind of got into conversations. <laughs> Any questions while I'm up here? So <laughs> I, I do have a question. I, sure. I, I know we talked about the Netta. The infamous Netta, they have no cones anymore, so they're not infamous anymore. <laughs> but like, did you look at any scheme where like Fulton, like you have this cross block thing of Fulton Street, but now you're adding, an, I know you're not adding because you had four and you're going to two curb cuts, but I just know like any curb cut within like 300 feet of that circle is just like a nightmare. <laughs> is there any, and I assume you looked at other options, but is there any way to get your curb cuts on Fulton and not yeah. on the the two side streets? We, we, and Rachel and I can share this. Um, we looked at multiple options for this. And, and as Bruce said, um, but first of all, it's a very small site and the car chargers are what is leading the design. And so maximizing the number of car chargers and putting them in a location where they're not fronting on any of the three fronts of the, of the no property. Um, and creating rental spaces that are reasonable for a small cafe or pizza sure. shop or whatever. So the geometries of all of that left us here. So we did look at that. We looked at trying to reuse the existing buildings or adding on to them. We looked at trying to put, you know, building frontage on Con Street or on Pleasant Street. It just felt like... Um, as beautiful as we think car chargers are and parking and the canopy, that this was the right orientation for it to be most attractive and provide, this actually was the way to provide the most parking mm -hmm. um, and the most car chargers. Right, as Elon was saying, saying, when we, any, any scheme that looked at coming off of Fulton Ave, the site also is an, like a you know, rhombus. It, um, so as soon as you bisect the site, then you're you're having to make an L-shaped turn to get in or out. And it, the, we were just we're always looking for one or two feet and sort of not quite making making it work for parking or the building or clearances or setbacks. So mm -hmm. it just it just cut up already a small oddly shaped site even further. So this was a way to maximize that length on the on the longest dimension. And one other thing is that you know, reducing the amount of vehicle circulation on site. Like Rachel was saying, we ended up, when we did try to come off of Fulton Street, there was a lot of uh, vehicle circulation and there was a lot of crossing of pedestrians and vehicles. This really separates the two and has a really nice, uh, safe pedestrian experience and a separate vehicle experience. Let's you take a right. It's 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 in and out both of those curb cuts though, right? It mm -hmm. is, but if you you know, if I was there and I saw a person trying to take a left on the mm -hmm. um, stuck there because no one would let them in. The roundabouts all backed out. You could take a, a right out on the yeah, taking a left out of there yeah, towards the gonna, roundabout is very dangerous. It's gonna be terrible, but you'll figure out to take a right out. Well, or we could make a rule about that. I think all those lefts are pretty dangerous. Yeah, people come off the circle and try to get left into the Florence Bank. It's a night, and it's it's hard. Yeah. Yeah, I don't think there's a better orientation for this site. Yeah, I have the same concern about those two entrances being so close to the roundabout. But you know, unfortunately, I use that ATM a lot, and I'm leaving town, 
on your bike. <laughs> and I still use cats. So uh, <laughs> when I go in and out of there, I don't really have a, uh, any issues, you know, yeah. with people. So um, I, did, I don't know what it was like, the pleasant journey when it was active. Yeah, I think people will adapt to it. I think it's a really smart project. I, I think the nine and a half wide, I mean, as wide as you can make them, you're going to get dings and people like pe people forget where their charging plug is as soon as they start parking, then they have to come out and go turn around. Well, imagine eight foot spot or was it eight and a half foot is our. Yeah, as wide as you can get it. Like, like I think it's fine. Every car, it's like, like you wouldn't fit. There's I wouldn't no care way. if it gets closer to the sidewalk because you're not hiding this thing, even if it's eight feet or four feet or whatever. I mean, you're going to see this huge thing and you want people to see it. Like we want to advertise that we have car charging here. Yeah. Better than an empty uh, used car lot. Right? Did you say half or nine and a half and half or nine foot? Yeah. But the one with the chargers are nine and a half. No. 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 Oh, not, they're no. all different. Oh, okay. Mm. I, I would and that's because you're trying to stay away from the lot line? Yes. We are trying. Yeah, yeah. I would say on the Pleasant Street, side you must, those are the ones that are nine right the ones yeah. here one two three so four, is there five any, they're five they're tight, nine. Though. the other thing that conveniently works with how everything i mean this site was like uh, uh made rachel and her team a little bit crazy because we're trying to make it accessible um we're trying to get in all the the 10 car chargers you have to do it in even numbers so sure. if you reduce it you're going down to eight instead of ten um and to get that accessible like everything is so tightly packed in there mm -hmm. um because i noticed the accessible pathway and the crosswalk align with the two accessible parking both for a non-charging space and a charging space and somewhat lines up with uh, well actually i guess we lost it doesn't line up with the center of the building anymore we, we lost that battle <laughs> <laughs> It's adjacent. adjacent, very close. Okay. Was there a zoning um, hearing as well? Yes. That was about the driveway. So, so there are four curb cuts going to two. Um, and so there are two ways they could have addressed it. And, and uh, the curb cut, the issue, the reason why it went to the zoning board or could have gone to the zoning board is because of the proximity to the Florence Bank driveway is less than 50 feet. But their existing curb cut they're showing on the screen was right at the intersection of Cons and Fulton. So um, um, clearly not me meeting that 50 foot offset requirement. So going to the zoning board is, was a way to still not meet the 50 feet, but it's an improvement um because it's pulling it's not no longer at the intersection of two streets and it's just near a driveway and did that get approved yes so we don't really need to address it and are we concerned about the light spillage along fulton so I would suggest because there's a sidewalk there that it's providing lighting to the sidewalk. Mm -hmm. Happier able to find bug compliant fixtures that are <laughs> Kelvin. There's tell your friends. Yes, Squire was in here last meeting and he couldn't find that. So we have a good lighting rep. Yeah. So. And share that in the office, I guess. It helps. It, I will say it helped that we have a lot of canopies. Yeah. So everything here is a canopy. So that helps with any, and there was a, one of the fixtures does have uplight because the canopy, it creates, it prevents that uplight. Yeah. So the canopies are actually helping us out a lot um, in this case. And we have no pole mounted lights that we're proposing. That's also why it was easier. So how do we reconcile that because the I, I assume that the fixture is going to say it's a bug a u of one or two or whatever but you're just saying well we're fixing that in the field it's a, it's a zero because it's a camp under a canopy but well it, i mean the fact is is there's not going to be an uplight so yeah, but yeah. You... i know it makes sense but that's not what our it's not what our Standard says our standard says U is zero. 
and that u is going to be not zero. Um, that's all. So that's for. Um, that's for under, so that's for site lighting, and this is meeting effectively another way of meeting the zero uplight standard. Right. So the easy way is just to pick up the box, well, yep. you know, the spec sheet and say, oh, okay, I can put this one in. It's uh, getting, <clears throat> getting late. I might suggest we open it up to the public comments a little bit, and then we'll come back to the board for some more questions. So at this point, is there anybody in council chambers who would like to speak um, to this application? Don't close it out yet. Yeah, I'm leaving you with the pretty picture. Oh, <laughs> what a saleswoman. <laughs> uh, hi, everybody. I'm Benjamin Spencer. I live on Rust Avenue in Northampton, and I'm here tonight uh, in support of this project. I mean, even more so after seeing this presentation, um, I think it's really exciting, and I think it's a great example of the gateway district form-based zoning so living up to the goals, it seems to me, from being a member of the public, reading these things off of the city's website, um, <laughs> you know, as far as I've been able to make out, it's just policy. <laughs> Bingo, right? This is this is an improvement. This is a big improvement, and it's really exciting to see. This is less impervious surfaces. This is multiple uses. This is a streetscape that is pedestrian friendly. Um, you know, I, I don't want to repeat all the good things that were already said about this, but, um, you know, as, as far as the parking goes, I think, great, you know, like there's, it's going to go to good use and, and, uh, I love the idea that there's the spaces that there are, um, you know, what else to say? I, I, uh, I, I, I think it's exciting to have this prospect of a couple of small um, retail or possible um, restaurant, like kind of incubator spaces, which might bring some interesting food options into town. I think the the only things that I was thinking about and hearing about all this is, um, you know, uh, e-bikes are also becoming hugely um, successful and a, a choice that a lot of people are making for transportation. And we're going to be seeing the construction of a multi-use path um, out Holyoke Street, uh, connecting Holyoke to Northampton in a way that is um, going to really improve safety uh, between those two communities, like a game-changing um, degree of improvement. That road is, uh, is scary right now, and that path is going to be transformative. And, you know, I would just encourage the developers to to consider that fact. You might start seeing a lot of people rolling into town on e-bikes or heading out of town on e-bikes. It's going to it's going to create a lot of really excellent um, cycling options when that's in place. Um, you know, and the only other thing that occurred to me listening to the earlier presentation tonight, talking about um, like historic markers or maybe wayfinding. Um, it might be really beneficial to have some kind of wayfinding that just says, you know, downtown's a, a 10 minute walk. And if you've got a car that's going to take you 30 minutes, just go ahead and, and do take a walk or something like that, because that's not far out of town. It's, it's really not far at all. And um, and it's a pleasant walk I mean, both on cons and up Pleasant Street, you know, as, as you walk into town. So encouraging people to to think about that. But, um, you know, I'm. As a member of the public, this is really exciting to see, and I think is really, in a lot of ways, just, um, I, I just, I just, uh, just, it's really exciting to see that these intentions actually come to fruition. And I've only started, I think, just within the past week, starting to see some drawings and and the uh, stuff that um, is online. But um, thanks. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Ben. Anyone else in the audience who'd like to speak to this application? You're the only other one in the audience. You okay? 
Yeah, I'm okay. I'm like, I'm really like, okay. <laughs> Francisco is the one who's created all the pretty pictures from my office. Is there any? Oh, I was going to ask if there's anyone online who would like to speak to this. I don't see any. Right. I don't see any raised hands. We did get an email this afternoon from someone, so I'll just quickly read that. Um, not able to make the planning board meeting tonight, but wanted to express my support for the proposal. Uh, the proposal clearly took care to review the design standards put in place for the Central Gateway bis Business District. Appreciate all the attention paid to the outdoor space, walkability, and sustainability. Even with parking lot, it still includes solar canopy with 10 spots for EV charging, which I really appreciate. Um, Taylor Gus. Thank you, Taylor. All right, so then back to questions from the board for the applicant. Uh, I have a couple of comments. Um, just on, on, in regards to the Fulton Ave, the the light trespass, um, would you, I mean, I'm assuming the businesses aren't going to be 24-7. Is that true or? Okay. No, we would um, like to keep the bathroom accessible and, you know, if somebody's driving middle of the night yeah that makes sense right yeah you want the ev accessible the full time so possibly those lights could get dimmed or i mean that's what we've i don't know yeah it's hard to say because we don't know who the tenants are exactly right. um it's possible that the center uh you know grab and go sort of convenience could have later hours um, right so you might have an area that's just sort of open well, it, or something definitely so. coming off the parking lot the idea is that um i think what would happen is there'd be a code if you're parking at the charger so that you can use the bathroom oh no i hit something what did i do <laughs> <laughs> okay it's not showing up for you also would it be a code to get in the the main door or just to get just into to the get into the bathrooms oh no <gasps> Step away. <laughs> I didn't know any of that freaking awesome. <laughs> Wait, little Stevie. <laughs> um. Yeah. So. Okay. Yeah. If if the businesses were closed, I imagine the lights could certainly be you know. Well, our ordinance speaks to that pretty yeah. directly. Yeah. If yeah. An hour after the businesses are closed, then lights go out. Um, right. You know, it doesn't speak to something that's open 24 hours like the charging stations. So they would be open. They could still have lights on. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yep. And is there a plan for snow removal? And yeah, there's not a whole lot of space on the site. There's not a lot of space on the site. They, it, it's um, Bruce would have to manage the sidewalks and then um, probably remove the snow, have the snow removed from the parking area. Okay. And I'm just I'm also curious about the um the canopy and that's slanted towards the south towards the that would be towards the Warrants Bank um and having solar panels on my house I know how they the snow just sort of slides off and thump is there um is that going to end up on the Warrants Bank or is there there's a fence there there's a six foot gap sorry between the edge of the canopy okay and and the fence okay. And that's also where we have a drainage, drainage swale also. Okay, great. I guess we'll see if that fence survives or not. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, if there's a big heavy snow, we'll see. <laughs> it's six feet signal. Unfortunately, unfortunately, it's not happening very much anymore. No, right. Oh. True. And you mentioned the uh, the garbage and recycling will be roller bins, so smaller boxes that'll be rolled out to the street for pickup on Pleasant or Conch? Yep. As opposed to... You have a designated storage area on site right. for the bins, basically the park. It can't be as such that it's high enough. And it's not in the middle of the driveway. So. Uh-huh. You might consider that as part of the uh, uh, permit that there's no dumpster site. I I mean I the heart of this for me is the parking. It's really hard to get around. It's 
the point of the place is that cars go to it. Um, and there's no parking. Like, I don't, I don't know if there could be a, an agreement with, I mean, I think Netta uses the parking lot across the street. There's some sort of like a leased parking agreement or something. Like, I just, I really don't know. I'm also having a hard time seeing how these two tenant spaces are going to have, you know, 80 seats. But not each. There's a, uh, the total occupancy is about 86. And so the number of seats are about 35 plus staff. Okay. Each. Okay. And 35 that's... seats in each or total for both? seats in each of the... Um, restaurant, potential cafe or pizza place. Uh -huh. Plus there's some occupancy, um, I think like nine or 10 or something in the center um, convenience mm -hmm. place. Yeah, I imagine management will have to work out some something for their staff and employees not to park there, right? <laughs> something nearby or all those mandates yes. that they ride bicycles. Yeah. That would be great. E-bikes. Um, E-bikes. Um, I agree. There is there is some parking, quite a bit of parking up along Con Street next to Netta. Really? Um, yeah. Yeah. If, if we look at that, uh, yeah, if we look at that map, you can see. It seems insane, but you can. I'm, I'm sure none of the Netta staff parks there currently. Well, they came to us with their like parking thing a couple years ago. Yeah. They they tore down a house, not a historic house, but they took. How do we know? Made a parking lot. You don't know that. Joni Mitchell was there. <laughs> I, I, I mean, I don't know. Personally, I don't see the parking as an issue. I think this is going to be a draw for if it if the coffee is five percent better than the Fairfield, like everyone's going to go across the street from the hotel. <laughs> sure. And uh, and people who are the the people charging, it's a self limiting thing, like. Well, that's what I, yeah, that's what I worry about. Well, worst comes to worst, like there's no chargers open. They're going to come to downtown, go to one of, there might be another coffee shop in downtown Northampton and then come back, you know, and get, you know, I don't know. I think this is like important infrastructure to develop. And I think it's an interesting model and maybe it's not quite enough spots and there has to be another one where the car washes or something, you know, I don't know. Like yeah. we don't ask, you know, every gas station to. Right. But we have. We have like parking requirements. I know, but it's based on a restaurant calc, which this is not a restaurant. This is not, but I mean, it's, it is uh, per zoning, but it, it, it's it's a restaurant in the way that the Dunkin' Donuts inside the gas station is a restaurant, which yes, technically it's a restaurant. Per zoning, it's a restaurant, but like we don't think of it in that same way. And I don't think it has the demand in the same way. I just don't, I, I think that's where we started. I don't think anyone knows but the parking demand well, no, is for I a agree site with like you that. that it's a self limiting. The parking really drives who's going to go into the space in a lot of ways. I, I kind of worry about that. Or you mean space, but part of the challenge will be for the developer to entice somebody to rent there. <laughs> right. Yeah, so, right. and he's taking that gamble, mm -hmm. right? To right. be able to get restaurants in there that he'll. We're going to have to believe that a lot of people will come from the hotels or from Netta or across the street when their car's being worked on. And I think there is enough people there, capacity for pedestrians and bikes to kind of come there and not just cars. I mean, the good news is the business model is built on high traffic. And if there's a lot of high traffic, you make a lot of money, you can buy the golden nozzle, build another one right there. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, traffic is money here. So, right? Well, I think it's a great innovative project and with some risk and and he's being very honest about the risk that he's, he's uh, looking at and he's, I'd like to see it happen. The, the downfall would be if cars are queuing up outside on Con Street or on Pleasant Street waiting to get in as other cars are coming out. If it gets, you know, I know you're not having drive through, which is wonderful, but that's, I think, what we would see if it became really, really popular. Or the way that Pi Bar and Coopers have like signs on each other, like don't park here right. if you're going there, like Netta, 
like net is an attractive nuisance now. Like people are going to want to park there, build up an appetite, come over to your cafe. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they're going to want to park in one of the many. I mean, when we reviewed the hotel, the new hotel, like there's a sea of parking within 100 feet of here. And I don't know, there's probably lots of deals to be made. Parking. Right. But I feel like usually we would say, show us your lease agreement for the extra 20 spaces. I think you would if it, you know, again, I think you're, the scenario is it's not going to have the same impact as in other areas and it's self-limiting. And so I think, you know, the demand will sort of push the owner to look at other options. Um, so I think that in some scenarios, yes, you might, you'd want to see the lease, but I'm, I'm not, uh, I certainly would argue that because it's sort of self-limiting in this commercial district, that the impacts are not going to be as they would in potentially other locations. I, I hear you. I, and I also think like it's worth the risk to help encourage this type of really kind of new development. I think it's the kind of thing, hopefully it becomes more commonplace. I think it is going to be the kind of thing that zoning needs to recognize separately from like a service station or something. Because it's just a different pattern of use. But to me, I feel like you know, we don't have any better information than anyone else. So we might as well encourage someone who wants to do it. But I mean, that's mine. And then what, so there's no, so this is a solar interconnect with the grid. There's no like on-site battery storage or anything like that. No, I anticipate that the chargers would use all the juice that's provided by the solar. Yeah. Oh, I, I it definitely will. <laughs> They'll use that and then some, right? There's on-site like... batteries driving in constantly. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> I mean, if, as long as there's people charging, it goes right into the battery. I, I mean, it's none of my business, but I'm curious, like how many, you know, on a good day, how many cars do you think you can charge via solar? I, I assume you're going to be buying grid electricity for a, a lot of it. I think once, um, you know, all of this is depending on usage in terms of the uh, chargers, but I think if they were up to about um, 12 to 16%, the Solar would provide about uh, thirty-three percent of the power, somewhere in that range. Oh, uh, okay. It's a hundred kilowatt system. Hmm. Okay, hundred kilowatt solar. All right. Solar. Hmm. Yeah, I never know what that means, honestly. But that's okay. So. Um, Carolyn has uh, kind of recommended to us about oh, eight other conditions um, in the staff report, some pretty technical around DPW. Just want to walk through those. So in case Carolyn wants to change any before we make a motion, uh, a vertical granite curve detail, blah, blah, blah. So that's six inches. That'll be specified. 88 curve ramp compliant with mass DOT transition length. I'm sure the um, applicant has seen these already. Construction details for permanent pavement path for utility work. Solar canopy construction details to ensure vehicle clearance with the PV canopy. All parking spaces meeting requirements and zoning, including 10 foot setback. So that one we can. Um... So that one we're going to delete. Yep. The curb line on the south side of Fulton Avenue revised to be straight in this location and the catch basin abandoned. Grading and utility plan showing new drain. And the proposed roof drain connection in Fulton Avenue should be PVC SDR 35. All DPW kind of specs. And then did we have any other um, we need to if we're going to accept, so mention that we are waiving the parking requirements in zoning. Um, no, at no dumpster, dumpster on site. Light at trespass. Light trespass on the sidewalk on Fulton Avenue. And that was the oh. first one that I said. The bike storage. Um, yeah, bike. Rack placement. 
Did we? Yeah, because they have the central door. Yes, so we don't need to do that. We semanticize that one. But there's one. So I think the big one might be that we're waiving the potential full parking requirement. Right. And the curb cut one, we also don't need to. That's gone through the earning. And then the light spillage. We need to do a waiver on that one. So two waivers. Other questions for the applicant? All right. I'll move to close the public hearing or close the public comment. Yep. A second. Great. Motions are made by David, seconded by Chris to close the public comment. Any discussion? All those in favor? Okay. Well, board members, anybody feel like they have a motion within them? It's David's last David's meeting. Last meeting. I, I just didn't did. catch all of the. <laughs> just as previously as previously uh, described, yeah, I, I would um, right. to approve the uh, application at uh, five Fulton Ave. Second. Motion's been made and seconded to approve the application for a 4744 plus square foot building, solar canopy, and EV charging by DC Coffee. Great. Any discussion? Comments? All right. All those in favor? Okay. Unanimous. Congratulations. Good luck. Well, thank you. Board Thanks for the nice graphic display. Make it all the difference. <laughs> <laughs> And now we can all go watch the debate. What's left? This is the real debate. You're all wore out. Thank you, everyone. Well, I don't think there's any other ads. Snow, and our little minutes to silver sauce, and I know this. You're a great guy. Well, welcome, Richie. Welcome, everybody. I mean, I'm into the dog. All right. And David, what to say? How how long? When was your start date here? I think I was 12 when I joined. Uh, <laughs> I don't remember. Someone said six years in the. Uh... Oh, is there a motion to adjourn? Oh, yeah. So no, I can't. <laughs>